Okay. No okay. signs of jet lag. Not, no signs. Tu veux être là ou tu préfères avec un comme ça tu peux te, non, je, je, tu te mets là. Okay. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, all. My name is Thomas Beck, director of the Nestle Research Center, and I would like to welcome you very warmly to the Nestle Research Center and to the 12th edition of the Nestle International Nutrition Symposium that we will have with you over the next two days. And uh, let me at this point already uh, thank uh, the people that were essential to bring this symposium, uh, symposium together, which is first of all the Nestle Nutrition Council, uh, our highest uh, scientific uh, advisory uh, body in Nestle, together with Johannes Lecoutre, uh, one of my um, collaborators, and uh, Monique Untenauer, who designed, organized uh, this symposium. Uh, but definitely also a very warm welcome and thanks to the speakers that have accepted to share their insights, their knowledge, their research with us and stimulate important discussions. Um, before we go into the symposium, I would like to just remind you of a few safety uh, topics. Um, we are, of course, uh, very interested that you not only come safe, but you leave safe. And uh, 
please, uh, what we see as one of the major causes of accidents in this building is people not watching their step, walking downstairs, looking at their iPhone or other devices. So please do watch your steps, hold the handrails, uh, use your iPhone while you're in a secure situation. Um, what is important for you to know, if there is an incident, if you smell fire, if uh, you uh, want to raise the alarm in any way, please dial 999. Three simple numbers, 999. Any telephone near you will see, uh, get you to security. Uh, just state uh, what your observation is and we'll take care of it. If there was an incident, the nearest escape routes are just behind you. There are two doors here. They are marked with a green sign. This is the exit uh, from this room. Another exit is just at the reception. Uh, their collection points will take care of you there. Now back to the symposium. And the ones that uh, accompany us for a while longer may be surprised why, again, do we have the topic of brain cognition, brain health and nutrition. We had it a few years ago already. Are we running out of ideas? Are we running out of steam? And this is not at all the case, uh, on the contrary. But in this field, there were so remarkable progress uh, insights made over the past years that it was absolutely necessary to bring this topic back. Uh, just to name one of the many uh, new insights, a much more direct connection of the brain and the uh, uh, body's immune system through the description of lymphatic vessels in the central nervous system, uh, as done by um, uh, Jonathan Tinnis of the University of uh, Virginia in, uh, I think, a July uh, edition of Nature this year. Um, you will hear about a lot of the new findings from colleagues, speakers of you uh, during the next two days. I want to also thank uh, specifically our chairpersons that will host the sessions. We have organized, as usual, uh, into four half-day sessions. And uh, the chair people today will be Susan Gasser and uh, Katinka Evers, and tomorrow uh, Pierre Magistretti and uh, Tamas Batfai. A very special welcome to Tamas. Uh, he, at the same time, becomes a member of the Nestle Nutrition Council. So welcome, Tamas. Now, I think we share all one passion in this room, either being deeply ingrained in the field of neurobiology, neuroscience, or having a passion of it. My background, I'm probably as far away from neurobiology as I could think. However, uh, my interest was triggered already early in my studies. And uh, the knowledge that was brought to me at the time was about a species that is able to navigate, to search food, to find home by integrating a number of different informations that uh, this species captures from the environment and from its own body, measuring steps, the length of steps, using a compass, using landmarks, olfactory signals, and most re remarkably, uh, in search, uh, displaying patterns that at the time were described to me uh, resemble extremely well uh, the search algorithms that NASA had uh, developed for search of people that get lost on the moon. So in the meantime, a number of those uh, findings have been put in question, but uh, the latest one was just reconfirmed in a 2015 publication, and was described as a structured search using a mixture of Gaussian and Pareto functions. You may wonder how much brain do you really need for this one of many biological functions that that species has to do? What species is it? Is it less than a milligram of brain? Is it more than a kilogram, up to the nine kilograms that whales have? The answer is surprising, it's very little, probably 250,000 neurons in total. And the species I'm talking about is a desert ant. Um, this is work mostly based on uh, the findings of uh, Vena and uh, his group in uh, the University of Zurich. Uh, what is amazing is that those animals with uh, their small brain uh, can sense so many different things and while going out searching for food uh, about 10,000 times the length of their own body they will find a way back to their mound with uh, avoiding any hostile other uh, ant mounds in basically a straight line. And they have many correction mechanisms if they don't find the mound and have uh, very advanced search mechanisms that they can alter depending also on population density. So quite fascinating, but our next two days will not occupy us very much with ants, but with humans and uh, adequate models of human brain, brain function and brain health. And uh, I'm convinced that uh, we'll have uh, very interesting discussions and, and good insights. For Nestle, this field is of a growing importance because uh, definitely our brain, as it uh, basically gives limitations even in terms of how mature we are born uh, due to the size of uh, the brain casing we have, 
um, the enormous nutritional requirements, uh, brain depending on life stage and, and activity level requiring 25 up to 40% of the total body energy in glucose, uh, causing a lot of oxidative stress, poses question and demands a uh, very, very specific nutritional uh, support of this uh, Im important organ. And uh, this is what we will talk about for the next two days. Without further delay, I want to introduce Susan Gasser. Susan is as well a member of the National Nutrition Council, more importantly the director of the Friedrich Miescher Institute in Basel and also affiliated as a university professor in the University of Basel. Susan, good morning and thank you. Thank you. Welcome, welcome to uh, this symposium. It is uh, my honor and um, actually challenge for me uh, to introduce the morning session, but also basically bring us up to speed so that we can actually all appreciate the depth of the talks we're going to hear. Um, so the brain is the, you know, it's been called the last great frontier, sorry. Um, it's, it's an enormous challenge. It's a mixture of being hardwired and then plasticity, the ability to learn, to respond to the environment. It's one of the most dynamic organs of our body. Um, and yet it's incredibly complex. In fact, I think one of the most fascinating things just to think about is that we, only our brain will be able to understand our brain. Um, but let me dissect it um, as a non-neurobiologist for, um, for the non-neurobiologists of the audience. Um, our brain and our cognition, our mind, brain, function on many, many levels and, from the, and, and is actually steered. What we, we need to understand, actually, each of these levels if we're going to understand the whole thing. So, of course, at the very bottom is our genes and pathways. There are cells that have cell-cell contacts. There are um, mutations that cause neurological disorders. Um, and they're manifest usually in the function of neurons. So the basic cell of the brain is the neuron. Neurons are strung together, billions of them in our brain, as, cell, in, as different cell types. Their connections create circuits, and many people believe that the basic building block of the brain are the circuits. It's circuits, not, not a cell, that's going to be the basic unit of, of neuronal function. Then we get to the more challenge. How do these circuits be they olfactory, visual, uh, memory, all, all kinds of circuits, learning circuits, fear circuits. How do they work together to make a thinking or organism, an organism that ha can learn, can play chess, can uh, move his hands, recognize items, this we will deal with today. And finally, far more than that, how is it that we act, our, bra our brains are able to act recognize the minds of others, recognize the will and, and um, knowledge that we can communicate, interact, share, build societies. These are all brain functions. Social understand, understandings, others, morals, et, mores, ethics, it's not just understanding our word, world and how it impinges on us, it's how the world impinges on others. So, Start at the beginning, once again, the neuron's the basis. The neuron uh, has cell bodies and lots of very long processes. Uh, you can measure uh, synapses of the key communication points of cells. You can measure uh, potentials. This is the, let's say, the basic, if you want, the, the, the flow of the energy throughout the brain. However, no neuron is alone, and as imaged already in, in la uh, two centuries ago, uh, the neurons are um, embedded in networks in an incredibly dense network, network, network of cell-cell interactions. So uh, they are compacted into this gray matter that you can only actually understand on the level of EM. And once you do, you realize that there are networks. You can trace them through layers and layers of brain, figure out who's connected to who, and until you've realized there are subdivisions of the brain that are connected within each other, here's a hippocampus, the center of learning, where different cell types 
are going to be extending and as we learn, forming new synapses, trimming them back, reforming them, trimming them back as we go through the process of learning and memory. So this is one level at which we can understand the brain, processes, contacts, all this growth and retrimming re requires energy, requires nutrition. It is the basis of what we learn, of what creates our brain, and of course um, is in a sense an epigenetic event. So um, knowing which cells are doing what and how they uh, respond to the environment uh, will be the topic of um, Dr. Professor Matthews. I'm not doing this in the order they're appearing, but in the order <laughs> of complexity. Um, he will be, he's from uh, Professor Stephen Matthews. I'll introduce him in detail later. He's from the University of Toronto. And he will talk to us about how changes in fetal environment and long-term effects, have long-term effects on neurological and endocrine function. So these are epigenetic changes that um, may affect um, the very structure of the brain. But let's go back. Um, what about the organism? How does an individual integrate signals? How does a brain basically work? Um, when we look at a whole brain, um, we can map um, networks of cells. We can map activity domains of uh, action potentials in, in, in model organisms. In model organisms, actually, now, we can trace this network by individual neurons, individually encoded, individually labeled either through the EM network or through activity. However, we look at the whole brain, we see, well, you know, all these neurons make connections trans, uh, through different co compartments, and yet the whole thing looks very symmetric. It looks almost like a mirror image. How does it work? And then when we, to probe actually activity within a human brain, um, you don't use these um, molecular tools that I just flashed through, but you use fMRI. fMRI measures blood flow within different regions of the brain. And indeed, what we learn then is that the brain is not entirely symmetrical. There are different parts that light up uh, specifically in response to different actions, in response to different words, in response to different concepts. It's an amazing sensitivity of the brain uh, mapping of lights, sites of activity. How do the domains talk to each other? Well, this is, of course, the life work of our key speak, keynote speaker this morning. Um, as, as, even as a graduate student, um, Professor Gazzaniga looked at how the two parts, the sides of the brain talk to each other. They're only linked by a, a network of fibers called the corpus callosum. In fact, I'm not going to, of course, explain his whole work, but the, the upshot, I'm sure you've heard, is that actually the two sides of our brain are, in fact, quite different, as symmetrical as they look. Um, one side, uh, tend, if we want to generalize, tends to be very logical, mathematical. One side tends to be um, uh, intuitive and, and uh, sensitive to art and music. Um, these are uh, embodied in the split brain study, who um, Michael Gazzaniga's PhD professor uh, and colleague um, uh, um, brought to fame. But when you look back at the papers that were the, ground, the groundbreaking and underlying papers of this theory, they were actually our keynote speakers. So um, these, this has, of course, been the topic of study for 50 years. And I think it's not only um, trying to understand um, how the two halves are different, but actually how they talk together, how they come together to create a functional um, human being is the, is the fascinating um, problem and, and brings us into the realm of consciousness. How do we know, how does the right hand know what the left hand is doing? So as I said, um, our keynote speaker will be Professor Michael Gazzaniga. He's um, head of the SAGE Center for the Study of the Mind at the University of California in Santa Barbara. He did his PhD with uh, Roger Sperry in Caltech in 1964. Was then at Cornell Medical School, Dartmouth Medical College for many years, 
um, working on exactly this question of the two halves of the brain, how they work separately and apart, and, and then move back to California. Now there is one more step. We have pathways, we have circuitries, we have a brain working together that gives us behavioral readout. It gives us learning, gives us response to the world. But in fact, there's even the concept of mind, knowledge that we know that we have a mind and that we can imagine what other minds are thinking and thinking about us. That brings us actually to our um, third speaker of the morning, Professor Rebecca Sachs from MIT. She's um, made her career, which is still in the budding stage, I'm sure, uh, on the theory of mind. Um, what she asks is, how is it that our mind knows what other minds might be thinking? How is it that we have a concept of mind perception in another being. This is a question of how does our mind embrace social moral, mores and ethics? And if you looked at her recent papers, it, it comes to an, an even more complex question. Do we see or perceive what we expect to see? Or are we really open to everything coming in? In other words, are we projecting ourselves on our world? Are we projecting um, the rigidity of our brain and its networks on um, our perceptions, or uh, are they always new? So I actually don't know what she's going to talk about, because <laughs> she does. these are quite different topics, we'll see. But I think, uh, I hope I've whetted your appetite for exploring the whole gamut of how our brain functions, how cognition works, and um, how we function as human beings, thinking human beings. So without further ado, it's a great honor to welcome um, Michael Gadzaniga. Um, as I mentioned, he's led a, an exemplary career. Um, his groundbreaking experiments were as a graduate student at Caltech. Uh, I could never imagine as a graduate student uh, cutting parts of someone's brain. So <laughs> this is uh, a sign that he's a groundbreaking, a person with groundbreaking thoughts. And um, we're very honored to explore the mind with you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, I, I overheard somebody at breakfast uh, say to his wife, Gazaniga, he's still alive? So. <laughs> this is what you get. It, it's, uh, <clears throat> it's obviously an, an honor and a great pleasure to be here and to carry out the assignment of trying to uh, survey a vast field of uh, generally called uh, cognitive neuroscience and how it may impact uh, on the brain. And more, more interestingly, uh, because of the particular interests of uh, this group, but also of this uh, uh, company, uh, how it impacts on society and maybe even touch on some of the ethical issues that come up when we now know so much about what happens not only when you eat right, but when you don't eat at all, and those kinds of questions. So it's a, it's a rich field, and let me try to do some some justice to it. I thought I'd take a minute by reminding us uh, what, we're, what it is we're trying to do. We're trying to make sure this young lady grows up just fine. When I watch TV, it's just some shows that you just, that are pretend. And, and when you explore, you get more imagination than you already have. And um, when you get more imagination, it makes you want to go deeper in so you can get more and see beautiful things. Like it could, the path, if it's a path, it could, lead you, it could lead you to a beach or something, and it could be beautiful. 
So I love her theory <laughs> about how the brain does all that. And it's the chore of uh, neuroscience and neurobiology to try to figure that out. And this, it's this underlying brain with its 89 billion, you always hear the number 100, the latest count is you only have 89 billion, and only 19 of them are in your cortex, and far fewer of them are actually in your frontal lobe, which is the uh, house of, uh, of uh, human uh, complexity. So uh, it is this question is, is, how does this brain, this magnificent organ, uh, create uh, such a wonderful thing? as the human mind, and we want to do it in as healthy a way as possible and not try to harm it in the many ways that uh, we seem to have thought up. So I thought I'd uh, start with a, a little perspective, a quick history of neuroscience as it was first uh, captured by a, a group of uh, uh, American and Canadian scientists a number of years ago. And they were right off the bat asking the question, well, how, how is this thing built? And asking that kind of question, you had uh, Carl Ashley sitting there on the left, Donald Marquis, and, and Donald Hebb. And they were very interested uh, in the questions, what are the brain's general principles? They weren't particularly interested in what's connected to what. They wanted to know what are the general principles, just like physics is interested in what are the general uh, principles. And Lashley uh, uh, started his career uh, with a series of studies trying to figure out how and where the engram, the memory information that we all experience is housed. How is that organized in the brain? And he did a series of studies where he crisscrossed the brain and cut it up in every which way and trying to do damage and find uh, the engram so that he could disrupt it and he just never did. And so he came up with a theory that all, all brain areas are sort of equal, that the, the action of the brain as a whole is what determines uh, its function and uh, as I said, there was this equal potentiality throughout the whole brain. And that was really a remarkable uh, an idea, a powerful idea that was picked up in many quarters uh, in American science. Uh, the great behaviorist John B. Watson, uh, it really uh, turns out that Watson and, and uh, Lashley were postdocs at Harvard together. And Watson went in to say his famous, uh, make his famous remarks about uh, that behaviorism and the contingencies of reward and punishment could explain all development of behavior, as he said here in this famous line, give me a dozen healthy infants in my own specified world to bring them up and I'll turn them into anything, baker, doctor, physician, chief, merchant chief, and so forth. So it was a strong idea and it was also enhanced by um, Paul Weiss, who then was the premier basic neurobiologist, Lashley was a physiological psychologist and looking at, quote, higher order things. Uh, Weiss was more of a laboratory neurobiologist. And uh, Weiss always pushed the idea of function precedes form. He would take frogs and add a supernumerary uh, uh, arm to it and determine that the way the neurons to that arm knew how to, to move the arm our, our extra extra appendage was by first growing out there in a, not, in a diffuse way and then the function of the arm stamps back on the nerves uh, exactly uh, what those nerves would do in order to enable it to act like, uh, act like a, a, a coordinated arm. And it was his graduate student, it turned out to then be my mentor, Roger Sperry, that threw uh, uh, a little bug into that uh, thought, and as he, as he defined Weiss's work, he says the growth of synaptic connections was conceived to be completely non-selective, diffuse, and universal downstream contacts. In other words, it grew, nerves just grew out there, the thing started to behave like an arm, and then the nerves became specified, so functions proceeds forward. And it's completely 100% wrong. And so uh, that was not a, a good uh, mentor relationship there. Uh, <laughs> so it was Roger Sperry himself who came along and uh, just turned everything upside down, as everybody knows, with his work showing the specific growth and nature of, uh, of growth and development in the nervous system. He did it with a string of experiments, very simple in nature, take a frog, uh, I turn it upside down 180 degrees and see if the frog would adapt to learn to uh, 
throw his tongue in the right direction instead of the exact opposite because of the surgery, and the frogs never did, and they would die making the uh, incorrect movement. And then through another series of brilliant experiments in the fish, he showed how nerve fibers would grow specifically to a particular point. They would plow through and not make synaptic connections in, if the, they were put into the wrong part of cortex. There had to be some kind of neurochemical match, it was hypothesized, in order for the specificity of the brain to be realized uh, and made up. And ump gene studies were done in those days uh, to argue for that point of view. And that notion that there is biologic specificity, that there's a lot, as it were, coming from the factory, that the specification of the brain uh, is a huge issue, uh, is a recurrent theme in neurobiology with modifications, which are important that I'll get to. But it's also, so it serves the basis of modern comparative work with the work of Leah Krebitzer and John Koss, where they basically show that the basic plan for how the brain is organized and, and the vertebrate is the same throughout. And all of this led uh, with, uh, and this is, <laughs> this is really skipping along the top of a gazillion papers, uh, but I'm trying to capture uh, the context for what I'll be talking about. All of this has led to uh, the notion that sort of a nature uh, is destiny. Uh, <laughs> this cartoon captures a lot of the work that uh, subsequently was shown that when identical twins are separated at birth but then <laughs> show up at some later point in life, uh, they marvel at how similar uh, they are. And this became welded in the minds of uh, many that uh, yeah, your DNA is your destiny and there's just not a whole lot you can do about it. Well, things started to change from destiny to interaction while the, uh, the picture on the left, and I won't show it for time, uh, shows the specificity of nerves growing, off, growing to a particular point in space, and again, underlining this neural specificity point, whereas the, the pictures to the right show how the synaptic density uh, in, the, in the cat cortex uh, uh, varies as a function of the extent of exposure to light as it goes through a development. So the notion was uh, that there's activity-dependent learning, that while the neurons may be going to uh, Switzerland, they may decide which town to live in. And this notion of the activity of the neuron that is being carried in the neuron that's growing actually modifies the actual synaptic uh, uh, locality of it is, of course, a huge idea which has all sorts of implications uh, going today. So if you take the big view in 50, when uh, uh, I didn't shave yet, uh, the notion was that there was your biology reality which resulted in the organism, which then uh, resulted in the adult, and it was a pretty, uh, pretty strong uh, view. And then uh, what happened uh, in the last 60 years, uh, 65 years, is that everybody realized that there's a very dynamic nature and interaction with the environment such that there's all kinds of epigenetic uh, forces influencing the developing child. And then, as I will try to uh, sketch, uh, there are many psychosocial forces that are um, very much involved in taking the developed brain and continuing to modify it, uh, affecting uh, outcome and variation uh, in uh, our cognition and lives. So these answers aren't, aren't really answered the extent of uh, of, of nature nurture and everybody knows there's now an interaction we don't we haven't nailed it down by any manner of means but that doesn't mean we shouldn't go forward and continue to examine information uh, and try to understand more and uh, that started too a number of years ago with the breathtaking work of uh, David Hubel and Torsten Weasel they said well let's see how this thing works and let's sink some electrodes into a primary sensory system the visual cortex of the cat as it were and let's start seeing if we can see how these neurons respond to uh, various kinds of discrete stimuli so in fact they did that and they uh, put electrodes in the cat and they discovered there were these things called edge detectors edge, edge detectors that they had certain orientation they had a certain neural organization supporting it and then kind of uh, integrating with the work of uh, Vernon Mountcastle came up with the notion, uh, among other things, of cortical columns 
and then how these cortical columns uh, were very specifically uh, arranged so that they can compute particular functions. They were localizable, and if one could ultimately understand the subtleties of interaction of those cortical columns, an actual mechanism could be unearthed that would explain whatever function uh, was at hand. Now, that was exciting. I want to tell you uh, it was exciting to see that uh, people in 1960 uh, were thinking about, you know, if I lesion the rat here, maybe he'll uh, fall off this cliff there. It, it wasn't very subtle, uh, uh, but it was all you had. And then along came Hubo and Weasel and Mountcastle and the individual electrode approach. And people seemed off to the races, so much so that, that I dropped what I was doing <coughs> and uh, went to Italy uh, from Caltech and worked with Giovanni Berlucchi and Giacomo Rezzolatti. And we thought, because of the split brain work uh, referred to by Dr. Gasser, uh, we thought we were going to nail this sucker once and for all. We knew that if the patient fixated at a point and you put some information on one side of the visual field, the left say that if they were going to speak around about it, it had to go through the corpus callosum. So we were going to stick our electrode in the corpus callosum and figure out the, the brain's Morse code once and for all. Oh, boy. And we actually, uh, just to reminisce a little bit, we actually got a grant to do that. <laughs> Can you imagine sending that in today as an idea? <laughs> so, uh, so there we were in Pisa, all set up, months of preparation with Giovanni and Giacomo. And the day comes when the cat's prepared. The screen is up there, the projector showing the the uh, edge, and the electrode is getting lowered into the corpus callosum. The speakers are on. Everything, everybody's waiting in great anticipation. We thought, sure, we'd hear the Morse code. And what we heard was the Beatles tune. <laughs> we all live in a yellow submarine <laughs> coming through, just as clear as a bell. And we realized that some ground loop had been uh, uh, occurred. But uh, Rizzolatti, very calmly and with the great fine hand of all Italians, uh, now, that is what I call high order <laughs> information, and we moved on to greater things. So, <laughs> so over the last 50 years, there's been a swift, swift, and I mean swift, 50 years is nothing in human history, uh, development of the brain imaging that was also referred to by Dr. Gasser from the original, some of the original efforts uh, where there was less than a half Tesla involved in the strength of the magnet to try to figure out what was going on in the brain to the latest uh, technologies. Uh, there's uh, 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 Camille Ergerville uh, in his new Minnesota 10 and a half T magnet. So uh, a uh, tenfold increase in the capacity. And with the high field magnets, the question and the desire is that maybe you could go back to those cortical columns I mentioned before and actually measure them in an undergraduate, in a regular old human looking at something uh, that was uh, presented to them. And in some original studies uh, carried out by another uh, high, uh, high, high field center, uh, uh, Rainier uh, Goebel, in fact, uh, has done that. He's taken, looked at uh, the response of the uh, cortical columns to edge detectors, uh, to patterns of light either moving in one direction up to the left or up to the right, and then recording uh, over the uh, MT area in humans and noticing that the uh, different cortical columns, this, these are uh, recordings at the columnar level, uh, moving in one direction when one set of uh, lines is presented and in another. This is a really ongoing research, and he, he allowed me to uh, show this to you because it's just an example of how specific and how incredibly dramatic the ability to study the human brain in action uh, has become. And then uh, looking at corticography and just the connections and knowing these circuits that were mentioned earlier that are so important and understanding ultimate uh, technique. Uh, again, th these were things that were started long, long time ago, but they were kind of funny in retrospect <laughs> as to how crude they were as opposed to what can be done now. Uh, one in particular that uh, we were involved in <coughs> was uh, with uh, Mark Xu and Day, who was actually a, a student here in Luzon for many years, uh, was uh, to take uh, cross-sections from uh, structural MRIs 
and map them uh, on a piece of paper, each, each cross section, draw them out tediously, and then put these together and try to flatten the cortex and see if you could measure the differences between the, uh, <coughs> the gyro and sulco patterns of individuals. Well, to do one map of one person took three months and a lot of, a lot of swearing, a lot of uh, cursing, and a lot of despair, and uh, never amounted to much. Uh, and uh, now, uh, here is an example, many, many centers do this. Here's an example from uh, Alan Evans at McGill, where the whole thing can be done with a push of a button once the scan has been uh, cr uh, collected. And uh, with this, uh, the hope is that someday uh, there will be a, a way of, the, of basically taking this picture and seeing variations in gyro uh, uh patterns along with uh, just, uh, along with uh, being able to look at cortical thickness and being able to detect the maturity of a brain uh, throughout uh, life uh, by simply uh, sticking your head in the scanner and letting the algorithms do the work. So and it's an astounding advance. It's all with us now. And the point is that these are now the tools that are ready to be applied to the gazillion problems I think most of you in the room uh, could think of and related to your own work. And then finally, just in the advances here, uh, <coughs> Excuse me. Um, the incredible advances in uh, d detecting connectivity uh, in the brain with the increased power of the magnets, with the increased uh, uh, beauty of the algorithms to look at the data, one can now uh, get incredibly fine-tuned descriptions of the white matter projections and with it make correlations about how that pattern actually is reflected in intellectual function. So, this all then, uh, and all these pretty pictures, this all then brings us up to uh, what I really want to tell you about, which is uh, <clears throat> the questions of how all this amounts to uh, capacity to look at issues in, in brain development and their impact on society. And I broke it down into sort of what I called good news, which is meaning good medical management, we can find out a lot about reading and reading disorders now and possibly propose interventions for the poor reader. Uh, looking at how an animal model in, in concert with a human model is looking at the role of depression uh, during pregnancy and the uh, pharmacological interventions that can uh, help in that situation. And the bad news is the m malnutrition the issue where its impact on gut uh, microbiota and uh, the brain, uh, looking at <clears throat> the very uh, important topic in American culture, and I'm sure here as well, about concussions that are occurring in uh, normal sports. It's such an issue in the United States that there's actually predictions that within five years or 10 years, depending on who you ask, uh, the mothers simply won't allow their boys to play football. And uh, that would be just, that would ruin my Sunday afternoons for the rest of my life. So it's, it's a big issue and there's a lot of interesting work going on. And then finally, the, the very uh, 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 worrisome effect of a low SES, low socioeconomic status impact versus high SES on actual uh, brain development. So I'll try to touch on these and then we'll call it a day. So. Um, the work that is learning uh, to read is, again, this is, the, and I want to emphasize this because there's so much talent in this room with labs who do many uh, similar overlapping things. Uh, I'm picking on some that I happen to know about, but uh, there's lots of work throughout the world being done on these issues. This is the work uh, coming, uh, <coughs> the work coming from uh, Stanford Group and Brian Wandel, uh, uh, where they're just taking the, the, the fact that Learning to read is a big, fat, long process. Uh, when you first start to look at it, it looks like mumbo jumbo, and it takes years to uh, practice and practice, and finally, uh, you're reading. And uh, there's people who read less well than others, and there now are techniques where you can look at the underlying physical changes that are occurring during that uh, reading uh, process. Everyone, everything from the neurons, the microglia, the bloods, the the, the vascular system that interacts with all those cellular processes, the white matter connections, the uh, 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 sculpting that goes on uh, during development, all of that can be 
be captured now with MR imaging and be correlated with the state of reading capacity uh, with a young child. And uh, so you have the situation uh, where, as I say, MRI uh, can pick this up. So the studies I want to uh, refer to you to are by Yateman, which uh, a student of uh, Brian Wandel's out of Stanford. And uh, they show very nicely that if you look at the, the, the arguous fasciculus, the main connection between the two language areas uh, of the brain, and you look during development, you see that its functional uh, capacity grows in the normal readers in this identifiable uh, rate. But you can also see that that functional capacity of this uh, structure uh, varies all over the place uh, in children. And it turns out they can pull those, those subjects out and look at their individual scores, and it correlates very, very nicely. So there's, in the phonological development that is so necessary uh, during reading, uh, you can see where the poor readers are not getting the sort of uh, uh, functional growth in this key pathway as where good readers uh, are. And then if you look at also the interior uh, 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 fasciculus, uh, you can also see, where, and this is the major output from the visual system to the, to the auditory system, it too uh, has impairments uh, that correlate with good and poor reading. And this would be for uh, complications that go on within the visual uh, domain itself. And so there, uh, Yateman and others, are uh, they have phonological training to, to deal with the arcuate fasciculus problem, and uh, they're right now working on interventions that might help uh, in the uh, visual d disruptions that they can detect through this. So reading is a hard thing to do. Our brains weren't built to read, and uh, the processes by which we uh, begin to read strain brains in various degrees, and some of them aren't so good at it, and can, can interventions be uh, brought to bear on this topic, and the answer is, I, I think so, and it looks very, very promising. Then uh, the pharmacological uh, interventions uh, during development are uh, another, and here is again, uh, so many of these things that, that are being mentioned, there's, they grow out of mouse models, and they go to human models and mouse models and back again. And uh, this one is, is originally being uh, developed in the mouse model, and this is a uh, the issue of depression uh, during pregnancy uh, and the consequences of treating the fetus. Now, keep this in mind as I tell you the result, because if you have any uh, lawyerly thoughts in your mind, this is where you would go to work. Uh, <clears throat> so 15% of women uh, suffer from depression during uh, a pregnancy. 200,000 babies exposed to antidepressants. These are just United States uh, figures, are exposed to uh, to antidepressants uh, during uh, pregnancy. And uh, so they just asked the question, this is in a mouse study, uh, long-term effects of uh, two, two antidepressants, Lexapro and Prozac, and these are both serotonin selective uh, reuptake inhibitors. And what uh, uh, Ann Andrews at UCLA has shown is that, uh, uh, let me just get up here. Uh, that, that mice exposed to Lexpro had permanent changes in serotonin neurotransmitters were, were Lex anxious as adults. So one drug had a more positive impact uh, in the life of the fetus than grew up that grows up to, to live its life in this mouse model versus uh, the other uh, group that was treated with the other drug. They're now doing this, repeating this uh, in humans and there's indications that the idea is going to hold. But just think about that for a second. So, so there you are with your child, and they're a little showing some effects, and the child goes to school and learns that there were these two drugs the mom could have taken, and she chose the wrong one, because that's why I'm a little wacky now. <laughs> so I think I'll sue her for child abuse. So I, pr I propose this bizarre scenario, I mean, uh, seemingly bizarre scenario uh, to, to Anne, and she says, don't talk about that that way. He says, they're already thinking. 
the legal mind uh, on these issues jumps right in and sees a case and, and putting aside its uh, value as a social good or not, uh, there is a legal argument to make. So these things that we're doing and we're all in there for the, the common good do have these unintended consequences or can have these unintended consequences. And I just wanted to alert that because of a couple of the, of the last topics. Uh, nutrition and microbiota, there are so many people here that are more informed about this uh, than I am. But let me just mention a, a paper that has just come out uh, from Mark Rakel, brain imaging expert, as you know, and uh, a student, Emmanuel Goyle, looking at uh, uh, possible effects of malnutrition on the microbiota. And he points out that, <clears throat> of course, not only are there big effects of, on the microbiota of, of, of true uh, malnutrition in the developing world, but in the local hospital down the street, in preemies and in other cases, there are similar crises affecting the microbiota, and it has a situation where if during the early development from, from uh, uh, birth on, there is this uh, failure to have a proper microbiota form, then there's consequences for the nervous system long term. Uh, They're proposing the uh, fact that uh, uh, with an ill-formed microbiota, there is an impact on uh, NAD which uh, impacts glycolysis, which is going like crazy a thousand days out from development because it is very active in the development of uh, frontal areas and prefrontal areas. And so that this nutrition thing cascades in to a problem in the developing brain and it's sculpting and can go on out to, uh, as you know, to 25 or, or 30 years. And so you can just see all of a sudden how, with modern science and modern biology, no, we used to just study a little thing over in one corner of the room. And now with all these capacities to tie together the dynamic nature of the underlying biology supporting uh, all of our brain studies, you see how complicated and, and rich uh, new explanations will look like. Uh, so Mark sums it up uh, in a way that, that basically uh, says, says that. Uh, <clears throat> brain concussions. So this is, a, this is a, as I say, a big issue in the United States. Uh, some of the unknown stories is while we think of uh, NFL kind of whacked brains uh, that you see on Sunday, every Sunday, the uh, other ones are, this is called Pop Warner football. These are your 10, 12 year old little boys who are out there getting uh, whacked too. And there's palpable uh, effects uh, uh, in that class of a young athlete as well. And in soccer, uh, the same thing, and uh, whether it's uh, female soccer, male soccer. And there's enough work going on now that suggests that there's an actual tearing, there's a potential tearing of the white matter fibers that goes on uh, with multiple uh, concussions and, and multiple uh, impacts. And uh, uh, one colleague, Jack Van Horn, uh, has, uh, using this technique called the connectome, as can show you the average connectome and how it looks and that richness of color you see there is a, sh is a, is a signal for the density and health of connections between areas. And you compare it to people who have had multiple uh, head injuries and you see that it's uh, de deeply affected uh, my colleague at Santa Barbara, uh, Scott Grafton, is trying to uh, build a database where he basically maps uh, onto the brain at every single point the uh, fiber connections that course through that point and to be able to then be able to analyze if there's a lesion here or a lesion there, what the cost is in terms of the long-term connections and mapping to the, to the, whole, the whole brain. So this is all coming. This is very early days. Some of these things are, are, are months or a year old, but uh, as with all uh, technological advances, uh, it'll get better and it'll be uh, quite striking. So, and then here are actual uh, studies that he completed, uh, this is Dr. Grafton again, uh, where he shows a large impact on my, my favorite structure, the callosum, due to, to head injuries where in the blue lines there, you see ill-formed uh, colossal fibers, and that should all uh, be, be red. 
so then the second the last thing quickly is the level of which all of this is impacting us on socio economic issues and this is a new field it's early days there's questions but like everything when it pops up in three or four or five or ten quarters there's something there that has to be studied and studied carefully and it's the role of potentially poverty and brain function or what's called low SES low socioeconomic status versus high SES and one of the first studies was done by a colleague Robert Knight at the University of Berkeley and here he's just using simple electrophysiologic measures ERPs as they're called and he's studying the impact of a well-known paradigm the evocation of something called the P300 when a novel a stimulus is presented and without going through it uh, let me just say what, what happens is that in low SES kids there is not the ability to ignore the novel stimulus and attend to what's called a target stimulus so there's there's a dis disruption in the measurable disruption in the behavior and then he with his recording electrodes can see this disruption being uh, signified uh, in the electrophysiologic record and it's driven by frontal lobe processes because he knows that from other studies and the notion is my goodness this is no bang on the head this is no uh, injury of that type it is the summed effect uh, of uh, a low SES environment versus regular now that's that's a strong claim that is the claim that is the data and it is uh, it is uh, verified uh, by a number of uh, uh, other studies, but there is one big issue in this field that has not yet been addressed, and that is, is it absolute SES or is it relative SES? So can you, can you take a person who has a job in town A that makes uh, $50,000 a year, uh, and let's say you live in New York City and you have that income, you're low SES. <laughs> Whereas if you move to Omaha, Nebraska, and you have that same job with that same income, you're high SES. And so it's how you perceive yourself in the socioeconomic status. Uh, that would be a relative judgment versus an absolute uh, 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 sort of measurement. And they haven't done those controls yet. Now, either way, that comes out, that's going to be interest. Can you make yourself sick by not thinking uh, that your life is, has, uh, has its worth no matter what your income, and so forth and so on. Too early to, to look at those matters, but uh, you see them coming down uh, the pike. And then finally, the individual variation that uh, we all know about, all parents know that they have a theory uh, about the nature of child development when their first child is born. And then when their second child is born, they have two theories. <laughs> and then the third and so forth. So the, the individual variation is uh, part of our lives. Uh, we love it. Uh, and again, there's all kinds of studies that show uh, the, the highly varied way with which our brains uh, are built. Uh, this study shows, in particular, the variations from a set point in four different subjects of how the brain organizes, how it's going to project its uh, the fibers through uh, its corpus callosum. And that would assume to have different impact on cognitive integration between the hemispheres. Or a study we did a number of years ago looking at the variation uh, that, uh, that contributes to the average summary we see in a brain activation uh, study. And we all were very used to seeing these average pictures, uh, but then we find out that if you look at the 20 or 30 or 40 subjects that go into that, their actual response is quite diverse and that how people are responding to a set stimuli is different. So we live, uh, and the pictures of this kind of variability are just getting better. So we, we live um, in a world where uh, we are in an age of, a, of uh, what we're going to call neurodiversity, the term has been coined uh, mostly by uh, uh, John Gabrielli at M MIT, where he, he basically goes through and shows that uh, there's any a number of areas, uh, whether it be obesity, reading, uh, what are some of the other ones here, alcoholism, uh, criminal uh, uh, re-arrest, 
they can be predicted by the brain scans of the person. Uh, because if they have brain scan X versus Y, you can predict their, their future uh, behavior. And this is an incredible uh, power and tool that has come as a result of the neural advances in neurotechnology, which are going to have, a, as I say, a huge impact on, on how we manage our society. And so this age, as he called it, neurodiversity is upon us. It sits upon this whole complex thing we already know about, how the brain and the mind interact and how that interacts through its social uh, structures. And it winds up with uh, this age of diversity. And if you read your science magazine, or Nature, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me, <laughs> the Nature uh, uh, this week, there's this uh, very, uh, a powerful uh, suggestion that uh, one can now uh, uh, put a grid across the brains of people and look at the correlations of activity in the various uh, areas of interest, figure out a fingerprint, as it were, of that Mr. Jones. This, is, this fingerprint is Richard Vakoviak. There's only one of them. And then you send that in to 200 other people and will it find Richard amongst this sea of other correlations? And it finds it 98% of the time, according to the new study. So the implication of this for uh, the criminal law system is huge. Uh, we can now say that that defendant is the person because we have his brain print uh, and, and so forth. So uh, it's a rich time. Uh, I think when you hear the studies you're going to hear over the next uh, couple of days and the advances at every level of it, it accumulates at the top into a better a human neuroscience with better uh, cues for advanced technology and then what are those going to do and mean for how we run our society uh, is, is just replete. So uh, tying all of this into uh, ethical and social issues of the day uh, is a part of the story and a part of the work that we're all doing. And I think we should uh, be heads up about it. So thank you. Very nice presentation. Uh, this is Jim Simpkins here. Um, you indicated that uh, there can be and probably is a dietary component to the richness with which the brain develops. Um, are there any studies that uh, indicate whether or not you can start that dietary intervention when a kid is 10 years old or is a young adult in the 20s or someone in the 30s? as opposed to needing to do that in the first thousand days. So there must be a room full of people here who could answer that question uh, <laughs> better than me. Uh, feel, feel free to jump in. I would assume so, but uh, is, there, is there an authority on that topic? I do know, I do know that my son-in-law uh, Call, he's a bioengineer, and he called uh, last week to announce that, uh, that he and my daughter, uh, who's pregnant, are going out for Indian food because he's determined the fetus can now taste it. And he wants to make damn sure that he has a pal to go to Indian dinners with. Thank you for the talk. This is uh, James Kozlowski, IBM Research. I was just... Um, Wanting to return to your comments about Weiss and function preceding form, synaptic right, growth, see, like oh, synaptic yeah. growth yeah. being projected onto the, the limb, uh, and, and your dismissal of that, and then Spiri's uh, observations that often form precedes function, um, and growth is directed to the limb um, preceding its function. I just I just wanted to return to what you got, what you showed about the arcuate and reading and, and ask him. Doesn't it seem that Weiss was right to some extent in that the arcuate is growing into a a brain that is already reading, uh, and those functions are uh, being adapted to the new growth in a way that's useful to the brain. Uh, in, in addition, TBI, we see um, reorganization or regrowth uh, 
perhaps to compensate for the injury that, that exceeds what would be expected simply to replace the previous function. Instead, it seems that the function that uh, the brain is engaged in is, is being reorganized by the growth uh, and, and the, uh, the new synaptic formations that occur during uh, recovery from TBI and stroke. Just wondered if you could comment on that. Well, it's a, it's a good question, and, and throughout all the, the uh, how I'm familiar with it is in the question of recovery of function in a neurologic sense, is it reprogramming or repurposing of a set of neurons to do other things? And some people say, well, there's repurposing, which would be kind of consistent with your idea, and others people say it was actually other pre-wired function that can cover that function. And so that there's not uh, a, a extensive uh, reprogram repurposing. So I, 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 think it's, I think it's a great question. I, I don't know the, the, the answer to it. Then Montcastle, of course, you shouldn't forget Kufler who trained Absolutely. David and Torsten. It was not Vernon Montcastle who trained them. <laughs> he mastered them. That's something different. I would like to address, however, something very important. You picked out, and obviously one has to do it arbitrarily, a very controversial study from UCLA uh, comparing two SSRI. Uh, Lexapro and Prusa and the epigenetic consequences of what happens when a depressed mother is on these drugs to the child's scholarly attitude. And I think it's important for us that we have a discussion, first of all with you and then with the group about this. I don't only one is because I have to make the first processor I sell me, then have to make Prozac, then have to make Lexapro. But I would like to point out to you that the question for these mothers were suicide or coming out of the depression and de delivering a child. And I don't want to know your answer, but obviously the treating physician decided that it was better to treat. That's number one. The toxicology studies done were 28 days. They could not possibly encompass the offsprings coming life. And here comes the most important issue, that more commonly than we take antidepressants, do we eat? Do we watch TV? Do you think we should forbid those mothers to watch horror films? They have huge effect on certain brain should we tell them not to eat? Because every day, this repetitive behavior will bring a very large number of ill-characterized neuroactive substances to the fetus. But most importantly, I oppose and disappointed by your lack of optimism about the adaptability of the brain of the child. We know that born with very different structural and social starts, that is the phenomenon of catching up. And I think that we see in this room thousands of examples, hundreds of examples <laughs> of people. Certainly, I was much less well fed in Hungary in 1945 than you were fed in the States. I am sure we were going at 600 colors. And I would argue that we can compare our academic achievements. <laughs> so that is a catcher. <laughs> and one must, not, one must not underestimate that A, that humans are self-reporting species. This mother's depression was noticed by others and reported by them. We treated them with the best will, the same way as we will serve you the meal with the best will and that even if it produces a structural change, there is an incredible adaptability and the time frame for this. So the eventual scholarly aptitude, by the time they are applying to Caltech both, between Lexapro and Prozac, 
maybe God. Yeah. So I really would like you to address, do you believe that this adaptation for the child doesn't exist? Do you believe you shouldn't treat people who happen to be pregnant? Great question. <laughs> <laughs> No, seriously. I, I, no, this I, is I, the heart of the matter. I, absolutely the heart of the matter, which is why I threw in those three slides. This is good, because when I hear these sorts of studies, and then when I hear there's this whole legal structure system ready to pounce on these little findings and, and clog up thinking in the, in the public health in general, I say that I, I, what I wonder is, are we all becoming a little too dainty? One little finding changes how you think about the long-term impact on, on somebody and completely undercuts the notion of variation and resilience. Resilience is a huge thing. And we even have a, a biogenetics of resilience, as I'm sure you, you're aware. So, so what I, my implicit message there was we should get this up and talk about it. Uh, because I don't see that it's a good thing where we're going uh, with the kinds of way I sketched it there. So apparently I was successful with you. So there. <laughs> okay, uh, one here and then one there. Uh, uh, Joseph Penninger from the Nestle Nutrition Council. Mm -hmm. So I just want, wanted to get the opinion. Uh, you know, the big efforts on mapping the, the human brain at the cellular resolution. Mm -hmm. But if it's circuits, so what's your opinion? Do we actually need cellular resolution? Mm -hmm. Or what we really need to understand are the circuits and we don't really care about the cells? Yeah, see, these, these are all the questions that, uh, <laughs> boy, I wish I had an answer to them. The, the, uh, the uh, you know, it, it, how to put this? Is, is the ultimate determination of the microcircuitry of a person kind of like the quantum uh, uh, knowledge of uh, a billiard ball. It, it, you don't need it. You, you don't need it to figure out the actual action and function. The brain's organized to perform action. How do, if we can understand how it performs action, we don't even care what the details of the neurons are. And I, I am willing to believe that in 15 years from now, People won't talk about neurons. They'll talk about their models of how this must be organized in order to carry out this action we know occurs in the, in the behavioral domain. I mean, that's already going on, but I, I think it'll, I think the neuroscientist of tomorrow will spend most of his training in uh, control and dynamic systems and mathematics, and the, there'll be these old time biologists that are sitting there looking at where the neurons connect, but they won't, they won't there'll be different enterprises. And I think if you're trying to understand how the brain gets its job done, it's more going to come more in the direction that you're suggesting. Which is why I'm glad I'm my age, because <laughs> I certainly would not have gone into the field if I had to learn all that stuff. Just, just to, I, I agree with that in general, but for instance, for neurological diseases, you know, the brain It's clear that we do have to understand the molecular basis of, sure. you know, what's going wrong. So, so you know, a perturbed uh, synaptic connection or, you know, or GABA receptor uh, secretion or, or uptake is often at the basis. If you, if you look at, you know, yeah. what are the loci that are connected with uh, autism, uh, these are structural proteins of the postsynaptic uh, density. So. We probably need both. <laughs> yes. I just want to add to something that you just said that um, the genes are important and they are to understand the clinical, the clinical interfaces into the neurons. Um, I'm very delighted to hear uh, Dr. Gazaniga say that we may get beyond neurons in our field because it has been uh, sort of a, a, a hindrance to progress in the, in the theoretical side. But I also wanted to point out in, in your comment that while a neuron's physiology and health is determined by its genes and its proteins, and protein pathways, systems biology, uh, I would say that's about 50% of what determines its physiology. The other 50% the other is its inputs. And in neuroscience, we have a horrible time modeling inputs to structures, largely because the brain is actually one circuit, and uh, we don't have a good model for the brain. So if we could understand, as, as Dr. Gazaniga was saying, the mathematics, the theory behind the neurons, that the neurons are adapting themselves to support, 
we could then model those inputs and I think do a better job of understanding autism, neurodegenerative diseases, et cetera. I was thinking that had we been sitting here a hundred years ago and listening to you, you would probably have been talking about phrenology and uh, saying that, uh, okay, today we can measure the length of the nose and the size of the skull and we can predict that you have a crimi criminal mind uh, and this was how thinking was then. Are, you not, are we not getting there where we are having, starting to have an inner phrenology that you can look into the brain, tell a guy you have a criminal mind uh, thus, we have decided that you will be eight years in prison instead of four because you will relapse in any case. Mm -hmm. uh, who should actually have this kind of information? Mm -hmm. And is it not also determinative in the way that uh, you can either use it as an excuse uh, for not doing anything because it's still it's hardwired in my brain, or you can use it against other people to say you don't have a chance, uh, so we won't bother with you. I think these are dangers which uh, yep. you should clearly address. So there, I mean, just there is an inner uh, phrenology that uh, a lot of people in, in uh, functional brain imaging are practicing. Uh, they want to know what the activation pattern is for someone with a particular disease state, someone under a particular cognitive challenge, and if they find a part of the brain that seems more active than not, uh, the, the, most people just say, well, that means that part's active in this process. They don't say that's the site of it, but we've got to understand that part in some mechanistic way uh, if we're going to have an understanding of the mechanism of whatever it is we're talking about. So for example, uh, we did a study a couple of years ago on, on low, medium, and high psychopathy and looking at uh, MRIs to see, because the reason it's of interest is because high psycho, people who score behaviorally high on the psychopathic scale have a high incidence of rearrest, and uh, people who have low uh, scored uh, much lower. So people want to, the prison people want to know, well, can we, can you tell us something? Because we're just kind of guessing as to who to let out of jail here. And uh, could you help us in any way increase uh, our capacity to make that prediction? Well, it turns out then, yeah, people with high, uh, uh, psychopathic, psychopathic scores did have a particular activation in a particular area. So get all this work done, and then uh, the lawyers say, well, that's cute, but uh, in the American legal system and in the British legal system, uh, if you've increased the probability that they'll have the knowledge that they'll be rearrested from, say, 60% to 80%, the legal system is built such that we give you that 20% chance to behave well. So <laughs> you, we're not going to use your data anyway, even though we have fine-tuned the probability through this correlation that means something, but we're not quite sure what. I mean, that, that's where things are. That's okay, just where they are. Questions, uh, one here, and then Joseph again. Okay, thank you, Dr. Casanegra. That was an amazing, inspiring lecture. So I'm Miguel Alonso from Boston. I have a question. So, um, all the data that you presented is it, um, all the data that uh, rely on, 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 you know, obtaining data in a laboratory environment where, you know, involving, uh, you know, very complicated environments and, and resources and extremely expensive, uh, uh, you know, devices or instruments and techniques. But, you know, we are aware that, it, you know, the rise of technology also includes these days the development of, the development of, of new portable methods that are smaller, but they have the possibility of scaling acquisition of data at a very massive scale. And, and uh, I wanted to ask your question, I, I wanted to ask your opinion about, about how you see progress in that direction. I think like the fact that some of, you know, kind of brain monitors or brain tools to, to, to measure brain function are gonna hit, you know, mainstream consumer, that, that's gonna be a big transformation. You know, every daily experience is gonna be a, potentially a brain experiment. So. So we are starting to see that also, not only with brain monitors, but also with brain stimulation, even uh, devices hitting consumers and in the hands of everybody. So, you know, from your broad perspective, how you see progress in that direction, how excited or unexcited you are related to that, what are your thoughts on that? And what role do you think those sort of methods will play in helping our knowledge of the brain and how will they transform the relationship between brain and society, bringing 
the brain language to our mainstream language. Yeah. Uh, it, neuroscience uh, are a bunch of cowboys. They don't really know the next question to ask. Uh, physics, they kind of narrow it down a little bit. They get the next question to ask. Not in neuroscience. There are 50 neuroscientists. There are 50 next questions uh, to, to ask. So the, the difficulty with zeroing in on the key approach, the key methodology, uh, is it's tough. And so what happens is you, you see a broad range of approaches. So people want the big data analysis approach. People want the, in, the independent scientist working in his uh, particular area. Maybe he'll come up with some idea that will have a general principle. Uh, I don't, I, I mean, I think that's a, a tension. Now, there are huge scientific uh, societies and uh, approaches that believe we've come to the time of big science and big data, and that's how it's going to be advanced. And they're going to find out lots of answers, and the theorists are going to sit there and say, yeah, but what's the question here? What's the question? They've got all kinds of things they're stumbling a problem by, by, by analyzing these big databases. That's one approach. People like it. There's a big, big movement in that direction, as everybody knows. But there's also a, a hardcore of people who want the individual scientists to be thinking of in terms of a specific question in a particular model. And I, I like that, too. I, 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 and I don't think there's any answer. I, I just think it's, uh, one would hope there's enough resource that both of these can go forward. We're not like some fields that knows what the next question is. Okay, two really brief. Uh, Stefan and then Joseph. Go ahead. Okay, very brief. First, first of all, thank you very much, Michael, especially for this historical mm -hmm. uh, wrap up, which, uh, which was truly refreshing. Can you update us on the reality behind this laterality of the two hemispheres mm -hmm. and, and tell us what the mechanisms are, if, mm -hmm. uh, if it can be done in a very short, in a very short way? Well, the, the, uh, the quick history is that. Uh, uh, when the human split brain work uh, was, was first articulated uh, in this time frame in 1961, it was so dramatic to see that you could split the mind. People still don't really grasp that. I mean, I can take your mind and turn it into two with a slice of a, of, of a knife. That, that, what's your theory? How do you, how do you explain that? That's still sitting there as an issue in my, in my mind. But then what happened is that there was this realization and observation, when I was in the room, I did it, where there, this one side didn't have any idea what the other side was doing. That, that was unbelievable. One side was talking to me all the time, and the other side was just pulling stuff off the shelf and putting where it, it would go. So that gave rise to the dichotomy. And then it became way overpopularized. Ski with the right side of your brain, you know. Uh, do this with your right side of your brain. And I wrote a paper somewhere back there uh, called "Left Brain Don't Leave Home Without It" because it, 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 uh, it's the guy, you know, or the persons. And it has all the other mechanisms of hypothesis generation and and complex thinking and so forth. So uh, I think what's happened is we're we're moved to the fact that there are all kinds of interesting things going on in the right brain and all kinds of interesting things going in the left brain, but it's a network with uh, uh, that. Actually, this is a nice segue, I might say, into uh, the next, uh, or, or into Rebecca's talk, where she is looking at the very uh, nature of some of the unique things that the right hemisphere does. and. And the question would be, what would happen if you disconnected the brain, a split brain patient? Would, would that reveal itself in the thinking patterns of the left hemisphere? And there's a little teeny bit of data on that, but not much. It's like if we now did split brain experiments, experiments knowing what she's about to tell you, we would do a whole different set of experiments to, to chase that down. But uh, so anyway, that, that all aside, the, the larger theory that we left was that there's a lot of bilateral organization in the animal kingdom, monkeys, rats, all the way up. 
And what happened is there was a fight for cortical space to develop these other things for, for language and speech and what have you. And so what happened is the left hemisphere, uh, that space was grabbed, and it used to hold some of these right hemisphere functions, but the left hemisphere language centers took it over. And the asymmetry was, a, was due to that, that the left hemisphere took the corresponding uh, mirror image areas that used to also do the right hemisphere stuff, but it, it's, it had to go so you could do language. And so as a result, you didn't get this asymmetry that the le left is language and the right is skilled in these other ways. It's not that the right learned something that the left didn't. So that model uh, uh, is the one I'm going to stick with. <laughs> Great. Well, I'd like to thank you for a lovely introduction to this subject, and we'll take a coffee break for 15 minutes.
App. App. It's genetically modified. <laughs> seats. Okay, um, we're, you know, we're in Switzerland, we have to start on time. <laughs> so, um, it's my pleasure to introduce the, the next speaker. I always already mentioned, so this will be brief. But uh, Stephen Matthews is Professor of Physiology, Obstetrics, Gynecology and Medicine at the University of Toronto. He is the Director uh, of Research at the Fraser Mustard Institute for Human Development. So we will be, he, he's um, British, was um, trained in PhD at University of Cambridge uh, in the UK and has been at Toronto since 1996. Now we're going to move, uh, we are going to move from um, maybe some of the global social issues uh, that studying the brain and understanding the brain and wanting to train the brain, um, raise for us, and uh, to, to real practical problems of, of the effects of hormones on uh, fetal development, the fetal development of the brain. So Stephen Matthews has pioneered the, the field of how glucocorticoids affect fetal development. Um, it's, as we've heard, you know, chemicals that affect infants or unborn infants is, a, of course, a, a burning topic. He'll go, bring us back down to the level of uh, genes and, and gene control and, and back up to the, to the level of, of um, infant behavior. Thank you very much. We look forward to your talk. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I'd like to thank the organizers for uh, inviting me to speak uh, with you today. This is just... Uh, a fantastic symposium. I'm very interested and excited to, to hear all of the talks. Um, what I wanted to do uh, today is really talk to you about the early environment and how the early environment shapes uh, the developing brain. I'm going to uh, run through uh, a series of, of concepts and, and, and areas uh, as I go through the talk today. I uh, am going to use illustrations from my lab and from, from other labs to uh, illustrate the concepts that I'm going to be talking to you uh, about. So I really want to start by, uh, first of all, talking about the concept of early life programming. Uh, say a little bit about brain and neuroendocrine development, because that's critical if we're going to understand how the environment influences development. I'm then going to say uh, something about how glucocorticoids uh, impact the developing brain and program, have the ability of, to program uh, function both in terms of structure, behavior, and uh, neuroendocrine function. I want to then spend some time talking about the mechanisms. And lastly, some of the uh, work that we've been doing recently, which is around the impact of early environment and the transgenerational transmission of effects um, that we're finding now. So 
The environment uh, during early life uh, establishes lifelong trajectories towards health or disease, learning capability and social function. We've known that for many years. Um, really, it was some of the work of David Barker that brought it back to the forefront, showing that small babies had a higher risk of cardiovascular disease. And he went on to show many other associations, as I'm sure many of you know. But that really reinvigorated a field which had been, um, no, had been around since the 30s, 40s, 50s, um, linking early environment to later onset uh, disease and later onset uh, social change. But those really important studies, bringing it to the human, uh, made the field uh, really go through a renaissance. And there's been huge interest uh, in the uh, uh, larger media around this. Uh, Time have actually run uh, several uh, issues around uh, how the envi early environment influences the rest of your life. Well, it's not that much of a, uh, a jump, really, because we know that a lot happens in the first years of life. If one considers moving from uh, a two-cell embryo through to a newborn child, the enormous changes that have occurred within that organism as it's developed, it's not surprising that the environment can have an impact. When we think about the developing brain, uh, and I'm sorry, Michael, I'm using the wrong number. I know now I should change this to 89 rather than 100 billion neurons. But the developing brain, uh, the, the brain at birth essentially has the majority of neurons that it's ever going to have, 100 billion neurons or 89 billion neurons. They all talk to each other. So there are uh, more than 60 trillion synapses within that brain. What happens in the fetal brain, and all of this is happening during the prenatal period, is that there is a massive overproduction of neurons. There's then ordered apoptosis, so about 50% of the neurons that are born actually die. And there's a huge amount of synaptic pruning that occurs in late gestation in the human and in early life, in early postnatal life. And then it's in the postnatal life that a lot of brain growth occurs and you get the formation of uh, the glial structures and uh, myelination of the brain. And as many of you know, the, ad the, uh, the six-year-old brain in the human uh, has achieved its adult size. So there's an enormous amount that happens during early life with respect to brain development. What we're very interested then is how these early influences, how the early env environment can influence long-term outcome. And here I'm summarising the work of several groups and, and thousands of publications showing that maternal anxiety and stress, hormones, drugs, placental insufficiency, undernutrition during pregnancy, uh, more recently the importance of maternal obesity and maternal care, have a huge impact on lifelong health. They have outcomes associated with hypertension, insulin resistance, diabetes, obesity and cancer so more peripheral uh, effects on the left-hand side, but we also know there are very uh, significant effects within the developing brain around uh, learning abilities, uh, links to attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, depression, and self-regulation. But what's really important is understanding what links the early environment, and this is what my lab is very much interested in, what links the early environment to changes in long-term health? How long do these effects last? And one point that I also omit from this slide is what can we do to prevent or reverse the effects of these adverse early environments? So let's spend a few minutes talking about brain and neuroendocrine development. Um, we know actually quite a lot about uh, the developing brain and, and my group and, and others have spent several years understanding the development of certain systems within the developing brain. We've been particularly interested in the hypothalamo-pituitary-adrenal axis and the HPA axis is well developed in the fetus and this is just a, a, an outline of this a schematic of the axis. We have the hippocampus up here that we've already seen lots of pictures of uh, earlier in the day. Um, the 
The hippocampus forming part of the limbic system is important in setting the tone of the paraventricular nucleus in the hypothalamus, which produces CRH and vasopressin, which then drive the anterior pituitary to synthesize and secrete ACTH, uh, ultimately to produce cortisol. The system is tightly regulated. Glucocorticoids are very important. They're very effective in setting homeostasis within an individual but they can be quite damaging if they're uh, left at high levels for any period of time. And so there is a uh, very uh, well-developed feedback system where there is a number of glucocorticoid receptors and mineralocorticoid receptors in the hippocampus and glucocorticoid receptors in the paraventricular nucleus and the anterior pituitary. So these glucocorticoids can feed back and uh, down-regulate and uh, the, uh, the axis in a negative feedback loop. And this, we know, is well-developed in the fetus. We know that the fetus, uh, if the fetus is stressed, this system can be activated. We know that glucocorticoid feedback is an operation. But something very interesting happens as the fetus approaches term. This system goes into hyperdrive. And this, on the right-hand side, is a, a paper from Abby Fowden's group in Cambridge showing the increases that occur in uh, fetal plasma cortisol concentrations in the last part of gestation in several mammalian species. So you can see here that over the last few weeks of gestation, the concentrations of fetal plasma cortisol increase. What I told you is that levels are regulated, and I, I told you that glucocorticoid feedback is in place in the developing uh, fetal hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, but something happens to allow the axis to go into hyperdrive. And that's something that we've been very interested in and continue to be interested in, is what allows this to happen. We know that there is a transfer of maternal cortisol across the placenta to the fetus, but Together with maternal and fetal cortisol, there's this big increase, and it doesn't shut down the axis in late gestation. Why is this surge important? This surge is really important because uh, glucocorticoids are critical in preparing the fetus to be a neonate. They're very important in development of the fetal lung to create a lung that will work in, that has been fluid-filled, that will now work uh, in uh, an air environment. And so that glucocorticoid surge essentially switches many systems, particularly the, the lung, the kidney, and also the brain, into a neonatal brain. We know that the brain, in, the late, in late gestation, the fetal brain is, uh, has high levels of uh, glucocorticoid receptors within it. This is actually a late gestation uh, guinea pig brain. The guinea pig gives birth to very mature, uh, neuroanatomically mature offspring. And here we have a cross-section showing the uh, hippocampus and the dentate gyrus and the paraventricular nucleus structures that I just introduced to you, as well as the amygdala. And you can see very high levels of glucocorticoid receptor in these brain structures in late gestation. We know the same is true in humans. So the brain is very receptive to glucocorticoids and very receptive to that glucocorticoid surge. And <clears throat> what we've shown and what others have shown is that glucocorticoids really are a master switch in the fetus and they are a critical master switch in the developing brain. And I'm going to come back later on in my talk to show you the data, but uh, we know that this switch is important at the level of gene transcription and at the level of epigenetic modification. And as I said, I will come back to show you the data to back that up later on. So <clears throat> what about glucocorticoids and programming? Well, my lab uh, has been very interested in how the prenatal environment, particularly maternal adversity and specifically glucocorticoids, how they impact on the developing brain to affect limbic system development, to affect the hypothalamus and the pituitary and to lead to changes in stress endocrinology and behaviour and learning. The reason for the red arrow between behaviour and learning and uh, stress endocrinology is we know that glucocorticoids are very important in setting uh, activity 
within the brain, very important in uh, both uh, many behaviours and also learning. We also know that long-term long changes in stress endocrinology can lead to disease susceptibility. Long-term changes in cortisol concentrations can have cumulative effects and are certainly implicated in the disease. I, again, I'll come back to that a little later in my presentation. So I've told you that, glu that glucocorticoid surge is really important in late gestation, but if the fetus is, or the fetus or the mother are stressed, then glucocorticoids can go up in the fetus before that final surge occurs. And what we're very interested in is the consequence of a glucocorticoid surge earlier than it's meant to be on the developing brain. We know that maternal stress, anxiety, depression, abuse and violence lead to increases in maternal cortisol. We know that there is a barrier between the mother and the fetus. In fact, maternal cortisol concentrations are about 20 times higher than they are in the fetus, and that's very important. But if you increase maternal cortisol, if maternal uh, cortisol is increased as a, as a result of stress, we do know that there is an increase in fetal cortisol concentrations. The fetus, as I told you, can respond to stress itself, and we know that uh, stresses like hypoglycemia, hypoxia and infection can increase cortisol concentrations in the fetus. We also know that uh, synthetic glucocorticoids, which are uh, given to pregnant women, will move across the placenta and enter the fetus and enter the developing brain. And this is actually a very important clinical uh, issue because uh, approximately 10% of pregnant women are diagnosed with preterm labour, and the majority of those women in the developed world will receive synthetic glucocorticoid treatment. And the reason they receive that synthetic glucocorticoid treatment is to mature the fetal lung. Remember that surge I showed you at the end of gestation? Well, if a fetus is born before that natural surge, its lungs are not going to work very effectively postnatally. So by giving a synthetic glucocorticoid uh, treatment to the mother, you accelerate fetal lung development so that that fetus, that fetal lung, uh, functions much better after birth. And in fact, we know that, glu that glucocorticoid treatment is very important in reducing respiratory distress syndrome in newborns. It's a very, very effective treatment. But we've been very interested in understanding whether there is a cost of such a treatment in the developing brain, which we know is listening to glucocorticoid concentrations in the fetus. So what do we know? Well, we know in, from animal studies and human studies that exposure of the developing brain to high levels of glucocorticoid before they're normally exposed to glucocorticoid can have effects on brain structures, can have effect on behaviours, can have effect on neurosensory function. We just uh, published recently a follow-up in a trial showing that repeat glucocorticoid exposures impact uh, uh, neurosensory function in children at five years of age, um, have impact on neuroendocrine function and cardiometabolic function. What I'm going to do uh, in the next few slides is to give you some illustrations of that uh, from our lab and from, from other labs. The first comes from uh, Alyssa Davis and colleagues um, at UC Davis. And uh, what this group did is they looked at the impact of giving early glucocorticoids, so a, a single course in this case of glucocorticoid. They, they looked, uh, using MRI, at children who were 6 to 10 years of age. These children had received, it as fetuses, or their mothers had received a synthetic glucocorticoid treatment, um, they had received one single course of glucocorticoids, and these mothers had actually now gone on to term, to deliver at term, so prematurity was factored out of this particular follow-up study. And that's another important point, that around 30% of women who uh, are diagnosed with, suspect, or are suspected of having preterm birth and receive synthetic glucocorticoid, around 30% of those women will go on to give birth at normal term. And that's because actually uh, diagnosing preterm birth is, is quite difficult. So in this study, uh, what Elisa Davis and, and colleagues showed was that when you looked in the anterior cingulate cortex, there was a thinning of the cortex in the anterior cingulate cortex. We know that a thinning of the cortex at this point is associated with an increase in affective disorders. And this was really the first detailed 
uh, anatomical study showing that uh, glucocorticoids could have a long-term outcome. Now, this is a relatively small study, and it is a retrospective study, and so one has to consider the limitations of that type of approach. Um, there's also been uh, some very recent studies from um, uh, Clements Kirschbaum's group in Dresden, in Germany, doing a follow-up study of pituitary adrenal function in children at 6 to 10 years of age following prenatal glucocorticoid exposure. And in this study, um, mothers, this was done in uh, children of mothers who were hospitalised during pregnancy, which is the circles, they were hospitalised in pregnancy and given glucocorticoids because of suspected preterm birth. But all of these women went on to give, a birth, give birth at normal term, all of the women in the study. Another group of women who were hospitalised during pregnancy but did not receive glucocorticoids. And then a third group were controls who were uh, matched controls who were not in hospital during pregnancy. And at six to ten years of age, these children were exposed to the tri a child-adapted TRIA stress test, which is the gold standard of assessing pituitary adrenal function in humans. And when they did this test in the 6 to 10-year-old children, those whose mothers received synthetic glucocorticoid showed a bigger, a greater response, a greater pituitary adrenal response to the TRIA stress test. Interestingly, effect was most prominent in girls and less prominent in boys. So we're using an animal model of in interested in understanding the mechanisms and the routes by which prenatal glucocorticoid might be affecting these structures. And I'm going to just show you a very small amount of data uh, <clears throat> that uh, we've generated from our lab. We've, we've published uh, much in this area over the last several years, and I'm just going to illustrate with some examples. So in this model, we use the guinea pig as a model because the guinea pig actually shows a neurodevelopmental pattern which is much closer to the human than rats and mice. Rats and mice, as you know, give birth to very altricial young and a lot of brain development, important brain development that goes on in the human fetal brain actually happens postnatally in rats and mice. So by using the guinea pig model, we're using a model where um, developmental profiles are quite similar to the human. It has a much longer gestation than, than mice and rats. They have a 70-day gestation. So we can really focus in at specific time points to look at the impact of glucocorticoids. In this case, we gave three repeat courses of glucocorticoids. We were able to uh, then look acutely, and I'll show you some of that data later, and we were able to look uh, longitudinally in, uh, in the first generation and indeed across multiple generations. When we... Uh, look at endocrine function and behaviours, and I'm just going to show you two examples. So this is an example where we have prenatally exposed uh, uh, the foetuses to synthetic glucocorticoid. We then look at these, uh, these animals when they're juveniles at day 24, and as was seen in the human, in the offspring whose mothers received synthetic glucocorticoid, there was an increase in their pituitary adrenal response when we put them into an open field environment and um, <coughs> significantly elevated over the, uh, the controls. Again, we saw a bigger effect in females than we saw in males. So we are seeing sex specificity of this effect of prenatal glucocorticoid. We also have looked at behaviours and shown that when we put these young animals into an open field environment, if their mothers got synthetic glucocorticoids, they are hyperactive in the open field environment uh, as young animals, but again, the effect is only seen in females with this particular model. We don't see the hyperactivity in males. When we look in the brain to see what's actually going on, we've looked at a whole series of uh, systems within the brain. One of the things that consistently pops up, actually, is the uh, hippocampal NMDA receptor. And in these animals where they're hyperactive, in the uh, postnatal phase following prenatal glucocorticoid exposure. Interestingly, we see a reduction in the NR1 subunit of the NMDA receptor. Again, the effect is in females only. It's not seen in males. Interestingly, we followed up these studies looking at long-term potentiation in young animals and shown that, um, as we might expect with this alteration in NMDA receptors, an alteration 
in long-term potentiation associated with prenatal glucocorticoid exposure. So the take-home message from this part of my talk is that the fetal HPA axis is well developed in late gestation, but that it's highly programmable. We know this from several studies, that it's possible to program the pituitary adrenal axis by manipulating the early environment. There's no question. We can uh, manipulate and, and get different outcomes with respect to pituitary adrenal function. Why is this important? It's important because the pituitary adrenal system, cortisol particularly, is very important in regulating metabolism, growth, repair, reproduction, essentially resource allocation within the body. As I mentioned earlier, very important in uh, behaviours and learning. And we know that glucocorticoids are very active within the, um, within the uh, transcriptome, that um, glucocorticoids affect the expression of uh, more than 10% of the genome. And we know that in many chronic diseases, there's dysregulation of pituitary adrenal function. And in many cases, hyperactivity or increased cortisol concentrations uh, associated with uh, diseases like insulin resistance, diabetes. So, <clears throat> what about mechanisms? How is it that early exposure to glucocorticoids before the time when there's that natural glucocorticoid surge, how is it that um, glucocorticoids are having their impact? Well, there are probably, and we know there are direct actions. So, glucocorticoids affect structure and wiring. We know that glucocorticoids are critical for several aspects of neurodevelopment. Neurogenesis, apoptosis, synapse formation, synapse pruning, all of the things that we know occur in, in uh, brain development, are, glucocorticoids are important. Too little glucocorticoid is bad, too much glucocorticoid is bad. The set point is critical, and that's why the fetus, uh, fetal glucocorticoids are to so tightly regulated. <coughs> so glucocorticoids we know can impact uh, structural development, that's been shown by uh, many studies in primates and also in uh, lower animals. There are indirect effects because we know that glucocorticoids impact the development of other systems, the thyroid axis, the liver, placenta. We know that thyroid hormone is critical in brain development. We know that the liver produces corticosteroid binding globulin and glucocorticoids can affect that during uh, fetal development. The placenta is very important in protecting the fetus from factors in the maternal circulation. It produces enzymes like 11 beta hsd 2 which allow the gradient of cortisol between the mother and the fetus. We know that glucocorticoids affect that. So there's several indirect ways in which glucocorticoids might be affecting the fetus. And then, of course, there's the possibility that glucocorticoids are, in fact, having direct epigenetic effects. We know that several of the genes that are very important in regulating pituitary adrenal function are, in fact, uh, epigenetically modulated, and, I, and that's uh, where we've spent a lot of emphasis and focus, and I'm going to spend the next part of the talk uh, talking to you about that. So we've been very interested then in how early exposure to glucocorticoids affects the development of the uh, epigenome. We've been particularly interested in the hippocampus, the hypothalamus and the pituitary, and I'm just going to talk to you briefly about the hippocampus today. We've been interested in uh, DNA methylation, microRNA and acetylation, but I'm going to just confine uh, the data that I'm going to show you today uh, to DNA methylation. So we did some very simple experiments, and these were done in collaboration with Moishe Ziff uh, at, at McGill University. What we did is we simply looked at the hippo hippocampal epigenome before and after the natural glucocorticoid surge. And we said, how does gene expression change? How does DNA methylation change? First thing is, when we look before and after the glucocorticoid surge, comparing 52 to 65, we see <clears throat> that there is profound change in the transcription of genes. There's a change in the transcription of around uh, 1,100 genes. The majority of those genes, there's an increase in expression. OK? When we look using a genome-wide approach, using uh, uh, ME-DIP followed by uh, arrays, we look at methylation across the epigenome at these two time points. We see that as gestation progresses from day 52 to day 65, though there's an increase in methylation in some 
genes. Predominantly, we've got a demethylation process occurring. So the green here indicates demethylation. Each of these lanes here represents the hippocampus of a fetus from independent mothers at day 52 and day 65. So that surge in late gestation and the developmental changes between 52 and 65 clearly indicate demethylation. So what's happening then is that glucocorticoids, we think, are coming in, resulting in a demethylation, allowing transcriptome factors, POL2 binding to come in and the genes to be switched on. So we think now we understand then at least how there is a massive upregulation of gene expression in late gestation. Obviously, a lot's happening between day 52 and day 65. It's not just glucocorticoids. There's a lot of other developmental processes going on. So we can't ascribe all of this to glucocorticoids, but it's a nice association. So the next question then is what happens if we simulate the glucocorticoid surge by giving glucocorticoids early? So here we gave, we gave glucocorticoids, synthetic glucocorticoids to mum on day 40 and day 50. We looked at, um, this is all before the natural glucocorticoid surge. And we asked the same questions. We looked at gene expression and DNA methylation within the hippocampus. What we saw is we saw an increase in the expression of around 1,100 genes with this early exposure to uh, glucocorticoid. And when we looked at the DNA methylation profile, we saw exactly the same profile as we'd seen following the, uh, the natural glucocorticoid surge. So this got us very excited. We thought, wow, we've just simulated the glucocorticoid surge, late gestation glucocorticoid surge, by giving glucocorticoids early. Well, of course, <clears throat> as in all experiments, it's never as simple as you think. And each of these lines represents a different gene. So we, of course, asked the uh, trainees in the lab to go back and look at each of the genes and tell us which genes were affected, how they were affected, and whether they were the same at both time points. And in fact, what emerged was quite an interesting story, that when we looked at the methylation profile, we saw changes in the methylation of profile of 257 um, uh, promoters between 52 and 65, 123 uh, between 52 uh, before or without glucocorticoid and then those that had been at glucocorticoid exposed. Remember, their methylation profiles look really similar, but in fact, they're different genes. Only 14 of the uh, methylation profiles corresponded to the, to the same genes. So this has really, I think, can be looked at in two ways. Perhaps it's the timing of exposure that's critical. If you expose the brain too early to glucocorticoid, in fact, what you do is you alter a completely different gene set. Or alternatively, cortisol, which is the endogenous glucocorticoid in guinea pigs and in humans, is different from synthetic glucocorticoids because um, <coughs> cortisol binds to both the mineralocorticoid receptor and the glucocorticoid receptor in the hippocampus, whereas synthetic glucocorticoids bind specifically to the glucocorticoid receptor. So there might be a pharmacological effect here going on. And these are very important issues that we need to understand. <coughs> what we're able to do, because we have everything at a gene-based uh, gene resolution, we can go in and we can use GR chip to see exactly where the glucocorticoid receptor is binding to DNA. We can look at methylation around that binding site and we can look at how that's affecting transcription and we, we do that quite regularly. We can also do longitudinal analysis. What I've shown you is data from fetuses. The next question is what happens to, in juveniles? What happens in young adults? What happens in aging adults? What happens across multiple generations? Is this epigenetic signature, does it remain or does it change with development? And I think the likelihood is that the latter, that the latter is the case, that glucocorticoids have a big impact on the developing epigenome, but they essentially then alter the trajectory of that epigenome as development carries on and as that individual goes through life. So how do glucocorticoids impact the developing epigenome? This is something that we've got uh, become very interested in. I already alluded to the fact that glucocorticoids uh, 
modify other systems. We know that modification of thyroid hormones uh, certainly would impact potentially the uh, fetal hippocampal epigenome. Glucocorticoids might alter the transport of placental methyl donors across the placenta. The glucocorticoids directly interact with the GRE to influence methylation. We've shown that very clearly. That glucocorticoids also alter the regulation of a number of critical epigenetic regulator genes like DNMT and MD MBD2, and we've published uh, work showing that that's indeed the case. We also know that glucocorticoids can modify the uh, uh, <clears throat> methionine cycle. Patients, for example, with Cushing syndrome have hyperhomocystinemia. We know that glucocorticoids, long-term exposure to high glucocorticoids can affect the methionine cycle, and we also know now that glucocorticoids seem to be affecting microRNA. So there are multiple ways in which glucocorticoids can impact the developing epigenome. But if we understand the mechanisms, the next question we have is can we, can we uh, create interventions to protect or reverse the effects of early exposure to glucocorticoid? I told you that glucocorticoid exposure in the developing fetus is really beneficial in the developing lung, but is there anything we can do to protect the effects within the central nervous system? And <clears throat> thinking about interventions, there have been a number of uh, studies that have used interventions to reverse adverse early environments. We know from the work of uh, Lillicrop and, and Mark Hansen's group in uh, Southampton that folic acid supplements um, protect against um, poor outcomes associated with maternal uh, diet, that high methyl donor diets can protect against obesity in offspring that are susceptible to obesity. That's the wonderful work from Rob Waterland down in Texas. That high methyl donor diets can improve neurocognitive uh, outcomes in infants, but on the other hand, others have shown uh, their effects on asthma. So this is certainly a very controversial area and the work of, uh, from Moishe Ziff Lab and, and Ian Weaver and Michael Meany showing that um, you can inject methionine into the brains of adult rats that were exposed to uh, poor maternal care and you can reverse the hippocampal methylation effects in adulthood by injecting methionine. And we're very interested then now in thinking about this in the context of brain protection during fetal development particularly with respect to glucocorticoid exposure. So I want to end by talking uh, a little about the transgenerational effects of glucocorticoids. And this is an area that we've really got into in the last uh, two or three years. Um, the experiments, again, undertaken uh, in the guinea pig, where we gave uh, glucocorticoids to the F0 mothers, if you like, we then let the F1 uh, animals be born. We took the females that had either come from control mothers or who had come from glucocorticoid exposed mothers, and we uh, mated them with control males. They went through a normal pregnancy with no uh, further treatment. We then looked in uh, offspring at multiple time points, and this work was published uh, relatively recently in uh, endocrinology. When we did that, we showed that there was clearly an endocrine phenotype and a behavioral phenotype, that these animals, so the animals who, uh, the young animals that are exposed to a swim stress, which we know is very potent and activating the pituitary adrenal system. When we look in normal animals who came normal second generation females and males, we see this robust response to the swim stress. In those animals whose grandmothers received glucocorticoid, there was a blunted, blunted pituitary adrenal response to um, the swim stress that these animals were hyperactive. We saw that in the first generation, the female. Second generation were off hyperactive, uh, but these males actually had reduced activity in the open field. So again, transgenerational effects through maternal transmission that are highly sex-specific. We've also uh, recently got very interested in the concept of paternal transmission. So here we take the male offspring from these F0 mothers who received, uh, who as fetuses were exposed to glucocorticoid. We mate these animals with control females. These females go through a normal pregnancy. We look at the F2. We then do the same to create the F3. 
Um, we've got some very, very interesting uh, behavioral and endocrine and uh, transcriptomic um, uh, information coming from these, which is going to be presented at the uh, International Doha meeting in Cape Town uh, early next month. And hopefully uh, I can show you that data in the not too distant future. But with this idea that paternal transmission is occurring, we got very interested in the idea of how, in fact, this message might get transmitted across generations. How is it possible that glucocorticoid exposure in the father will uh, affect their offspring and subsequent offspring? And these are studies, uh, two very recent studies. This study came from my group with Moishi Ziff, where we uh, did a very simple experiment here, in, actually in mice, where we exposed adult male mice to uh, uh, synthetic glucocorticoids. We then waited two sperm cycles and looked at methylation within the sperm, and we saw a decrease in non-CPG methylation associated with uh, glucocorticoid exposure in uh, adult mice. Tracy Bale, a colleague from uh, UPenn, has done some beautiful work in this area. This was a paper that was published uh, in 2014. And what Tracy's shown is that if fathers are stressed either during the pre pubertal period or the adult period, and she looks at the sperm of these animals, there are increases in specific microRNAs. And in a paper that I just uh, saw actually last night, um, what uh, Tracy's done has actually taken a selection of these microRNAs, injected them into uh, fertilized embryos, and shown that she can recapitulate the pituitary adrenal uh, phenotypes associated with paternal stress. So it does look like this microRNA is carrying an important signal. Okay, so to sum up then, I've shown you that the prenatal environment, uh, and I've talked specifically about glucocorticoids, impact the developing brain, that they result in long-term changes in stress, endocrinology, and behavior. I haven't shown you the data today, but we know that these effects are dependent on the time of exposure. And this is actually a really important area that needs more work. We need to understand when there are specific periods of sensitivity. The effects are highly sex-specific. They're age-dependent. You have to look at multiple time points throughout an animal's uh, life course to understand how the, what the impacts are. The effects are transgenerational. And I think we're starting to get now a pretty good handle on the mechanisms by which this uh, programming is occurring within the developing brain. But with this new knowledge, we perhaps can start to, to harness it and utilize it to identify biomarkers. So is it possible to take a uh, look for biomarkers, perhaps epigenetic biomarkers in newborns to identify those who might be at risk of, risk of uh, developing uh, phenotypes associated or poor outcomes associated with adversity in pregnancy? And with that, uh, does this new knowledge allow us to develop new, novel, intelligent interventions to prevent or reverse the effects? With that, I will finish and I will acknowledge the folk who have done all the work that I presented today. Those highlighted in red uh, undertook the studies that I showed you today. Thank you very much. Time for a few questions, yes. Yeah, um, very nice talk. Uh, it's Ed Beachy from the Institute, and that's the Institute of Health Science. I'm just curious about the transgenerational effects. When you go from male to the offspring, the transgenerational offspring, does it only go, does it only appear in the female, or does it appear in the male as well? And when you do the sperm transfer, does it only appear in the female, or does it appear? No, in the it, it's, it's interesting. When you look at the, the studies that are now emerging, and this is a very recent literature, but both males and females are affect, offspring are affected. Um, it very much depends on the nature of the prenatal insult or the nature of the prenatal treatment. Um, but it does, it transmits through to males and females in multiple generations. So it's not, it's not just in one sex. Uh, I think many are piqued by, by the gender differences that, that you're finding and what or how you would explain them. Uh, can you, do we know, do we have clues or can you speculate? Is, is this a phenotypic expression of receptors? Is it receptor density? 
It's, so that's a, a fantastic question. So um, we know that when we're exposing in late gestation to glucocorticoids, um, certainly in the human fetus, there's a lot of sexual differentiation going on within the brain at that point in time. Um, certainly in the guinea pig, there's a lot of sexual differentiation that's going on in the brain um, at, at around day 50. So it's possible that glucocorticoids are some way in interacting with that process. Um, we've looked at levels of receptors and the, the sort of simple stuff, and it's not simple. It's not that male fetuses express less receptors than females and so they're less affected. Um, so I think it's something probably to do with, with, with the sexual differentiation of, of different parts of the brain. What is really interesting is when you look at outcomes following maternal stress, um, and there's been some, some fantastic studies looking at gender of, different gender effects following maternal stress, and we see it following a glucocorticoid exposure, is that um, when you look at the patterns, the female patterns of gene expression, the female patterns of behavior, in males and females, what tends to happen is obviously there are, diff there are sex differences in those behaviours. What tends to happen is that with an insult like prenatal stress or an insult like prenatal glucocorticoid exposure, you tend to move the female phenotype more towards the male as a result of uh, the exposure. Okay, here. Okay. There are a lot of questions. Go ahead. Uh, there's quite a number of uh, children born uh, after we planned uh, cesareans rather shortly before birth, so they're nearly term, but they apparently don't have this search in uh, glucocorticoids. Is there statistics on these? Uh, what can one, is it a problem? Right, I think um, the, that's a very, it's an important question. So. Um, if you're doing a C-section close to term, I think in the human it would be safe to say that glucocorticoids would start to increase maybe three, three weeks before gestation. The numbers are kind of difficult to get, obviously. Um, but um, So if you're doing the, the C-section close to birth, then because um, that surge is not a result of the birthing process. There is, a result, there is an increase in pituitary adrenal function as a result of the birthing process, which is clearly quite stressful to the fetus. Um, but it, that surge that I was showing was, was before, uh, was in the last few weeks of gestation. So if C-section occurs before that, then they won't have had uh, the exposure. But it's an interesting point because um, one of the things that certainly I wear in my, my hat as being a member of obstetrics and gynaecology is that one of the areas of major concern is the preterm infant that's actually born between 32 and 36 six weeks of gestation. And the outcomes in those children is generally quite poor and has not been investigated in, in, in a lot of detail. And there's certainly a lot of interest in investigation of those children because those children, if they're born at 36 weeks, may not have been exposed to high levels that glucocorticoid surge. And if, if, if a preterm birth was not diagnosed before 32 weeks, they won't have got synthetic glucocorticoids. So there is an area where there is no glucocorticoid coverage, and that may be the basis of some of the problems. So glucocorticoids are so important in development, and they're so necessary for the fetal brain. could not be said so that the epigenetic agents will have to become more selective. As potent, but more selective. It seems that it's a very, very broad uh, uh, tool you are using. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't agree more, but the reason that we're interested in that, in glucocorticoids as a tool, is that because 10% of all pregnant women are currently being exposed to synthetic glucocorticoid. And for that reason, we're very interested in the long-term outcomes. I completely agree with, with 
the issues around BDNF. We know that that's very important. We simply haven't looked at it in our model. Yeah. Okay, last question. Uh, thank you very much for the interview. Uh, thank you very much for the interview. Uh, if you are aware of the story about the role of stress in the developing of dementia, particularly Alzheimer's type dementia. Uh, could you uh, tell us about the long-term effects in, in your animal and also the implications for humans? Can we say to can people who are designed to develop Alzheimer's disease uh, do this to some extent because of uh, early regulation? Uh, that excellent question. I'm sure there's, there's um, a number of ways which can connect prenatal stress, prenatal adversity to uh, long-term uh, neurologic decline. Um, one of the, I think, the simplest answer is, is that we know that uh, early exposure to prenatal stress, early exposure to uh, synthetic glucocorticoid actually does reduce the number of neurons within the hippocampus. We know that as an individual ages, hippocampal neurons are dying. And so in terms of just simply conceptualizing that, um, there's a point when the number of neurons dying will start to, or the, the loss of neurons is going to start to have a, an effect on function. And if you're born with 10% less hippocampal neurons as a result of being exposed to prenatal stress or a result of synthetic glucocorticoid exposure, then maybe you hit that time point earlier than if you hadn't. Um, so that's one very simple explanation, but I'm sure there's much more complex. In fact, uh, aging studies following prenatal insults have not been done uh, in any way as much as they need to have been done. So we continue, um, returning a bit to the theory of mind. Um, Rebecca Sachs comes to us from MIT, where she is a professor, um, well, is a cognitive neuroscientist. She will talk um, about her own laboratory's work on the thought, on thinking, on concepts, and uh, let's say a, a neuroscientist's view of mind. Thank you very much for coming. Okay. Well, thank you so much for having me. This is it's a an honor and a surprise uh, to be invited to speak at Nestle. Um, and it, it feels a little to me like this talk is going to be um, something completely different, but I'm told that this audience is used to that and indeed totally up for it. <laughs> so uh, although my research has nothing to do as far as I can tell with nutrition or taste, I, the best I can do here is I'll give you a flavor of my research. <laughs> the topic that I work on is um, sometimes called the social brain. Um, and this, what I want to turn to then is when we think about human intelligence, sometimes we have a tendency to think about math or language or problem-solving abilities. And I want to point you to what I think human brains are best at, maybe most evolved for, um, which is thinking about each other. We have minds and brains specifically tuned to and sensitive for solving problems about uh, interpersonal interactions. We use our capacity to think about other people in everything we do, from teaching and coordinating and flirting um, to competing and undermining one another. We are so sensitive to cues about other people's intentions that we perceive them even in the motions of um, simple shapes, as this famous demo from Fritz Heider in the 40s shows. Um, this capacity is incredibly early developing, so this is a movie where Every dot is the point of gaze of a preverbal infant. So these are infants aged two to nine months. And you can see that while watching a movie, all of the babies naturally and spontaneously look at people's faces and sometimes their hands. It's also incredibly sophisticated. So this is an apocryphal quote from Allen Ginsberg, who uh, um, apparently said, uh, 
that, sorry, not, uh, I'm forgetting his name now. Uh, Greenspan, yes, not the poet, the head of the federal, <laughs> right, okay, so he apparently said that, I know you think you understand what you thought I said, but I'm not sure you realize that what you heard was not what I meant. <laughs> Which is maybe actually more poetry than it is economics. Um, my work has focused, focused on this more high level or abstract capacity, sometimes called theory of mind, the ability to think about what other people think, want, and feel. Traditionally, this is a topic that has been studied in developmental psychology, so studying children's um, emerging capacity to think about other people because it undergoes dramatic and overt changes uh, in childhood. The most famous test of this is called the false belief task. And so again, to give you a sense of what this research is about, I'll let you watch two children, first a five-year-old, pass a, uh, do a false belief task. And so this is what that task looks like. This is the first pirate. His name is Ivan. And you know what pirates really like? What? Pirates really like cheese sandwiches. Cheese? I love cheese. Yeah. So Ivan has his cheese sandwich and he says, yum, 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 yum. I really love cheese sandwiches. And Ivan puts his sandwich over here on top of the pirate chest. And Ivan says, you know what? I need a drink with my lunch. And so Ivan goes to get a drink. And while Ivan is away, the wind comes. And it blows the sandwich down onto the grass. And now, here comes the other pirate. This pirate is called Joshua. See? And Joshua also really loves cheese sandwich. So Joshua has a cheese sandwich. And he says, yum, 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 yum. I love cheese sandwiches. And he puts his cheese sandwich over here on top of the pirate chest. So that one is his. That one's and Joshua's. Then, that's right. And then his went on the ground. Yeah. That's exactly right. Now, so he won't know which one is his. Oh, so now Joshua goes off to get a drink. <laughs> Ivan comes back and he says, I want my cheese sandwich. So which one do you think Ivan's going to take? I think he's going to take that one. Yeah, you think he's going to take that one? All right, let's see. I told you. Oh, yeah, one. you were right. He took that one. <laughs> Okay, so that's a five-year-old, and that's what's called passing the false belief task. And what we typically measure is the prediction at the end, which one does he say he'll take? But you see, this child is so ready to go, he stops me to tell me what problem is about to occur. He's anticipating what's going to happen in the story. Okay, this is now a three-year-old who's paid equally rapt attention to the entire movie. In fact, a few days later, he said to his mother, do pirates really like cheese sandwiches? <laughs> and here's the end of the story. And Ivan says, I want my cheese sandwich. Which sandwich is he going to take? Do you think he's going to take that one? Let's see what happens. Let's see what he does. Here comes Ivan. He says, I want my cheese sandwich. And he takes this one. Uh-oh. Why did he take that one? He was on the rack. Uh -huh. OK, and that's called failing a false belief task. And so what's critical here is both uh, so first of all, no lack of confidence. In fact, if you teach three-year-olds to bet, they will bet all their counters that if he wants his cheese sandwich, he'll take his cheese sandwich. And then when you see what actually happens, that he took the other pirate's cheese sandwich, instead of going to the kind of explanation the five-year-old or an adult goes to, well, he thought that one is his, he made a mistake, three-year-olds invent explanations for why he might no longer want his own cheese sandwich, like it had fallen on the ground. Okay, so there's been a lot of interest in the development of this capacity for recognizing and predicting what other people think, um, want, and feel in tasks like the one that I just showed you. Um, this is interesting partly because it seems to capture something uniquely human in our cognitive abilities, um, partly because it has strong implications for um, children in their education, including early, social uh, early school adjustment and readiness predicted by social cognition, um, and also especially maybe because of its public health implications um, because of the rising prevalence of developmental disorders like autism spectrum disorders that include deficits of social cognition. So lots of research has focused on children, but I just want to note that social cognition and theory of mind in particular is fundamental to adult cognition as well. Um, and to do this, I'm going to get you all to participate in the experiments that we do with adults. So um, 
in the, story, the experiment that you're about to do, I'm going to ask you to make a moral judgment. You're going to judge how much moral blame the character in the story deserves, and you're going to do so with your hand. The higher you raise your hand, the more moral blame she deserves. So if your hand is here, she deserves a little blame. If it's all the way up, she deserves a lot of blame. This is to make sure that you all are awake and listening. So here's the first story. OK, ready? Your hand to indicate moral blame. This story is about Grace. She's on a tour of a chemical factory. There's a break in the tour, and she goes to make a cup of coffee. Another girl on the tour asks for a cup of coffee with sugar in it, and next to the coffee machine is a jar of white powder labeled sugar. Unbeknownst to Grace, this jar has been contaminated with a dangerous toxic poison from the chemical factory, and so is deadly if ingested. Grace puts the powder in the other girl's coffee, and when the girl drinks the coffee, she dies. How much moral blame does Grace deserve for putting the the sugar in the coffee. Okay. Some of us missed whether she was aware or not that there was the a jar problem. of white powder is labeled sugar, so Grace thinks the powder is sugar. Okay. Now, what if I change just one feature of the story? What if the jar of white powder is labeled poison? So Grace thinks the powder is poison. Now, how much blame does she deserve for putting the powder in the coffee? OK, so almost everyone except maybe Thomas is awake. And this is um, what we call these kinds of moral judgments, the ones you just made or the ones made by the participants we call typical human adults, the MIT undergraduates in our lab, um, shows that the dominant factor in human adult moral judgment is what you think you're doing, what you know about the act consequences. So here we varied whether the girl dies or not, and whether Grace thinks it's poison or thinks justifiably that it's sugar. And what you can see is that much more than whether she causes a death, adult humans judge that moral blame depends on what you think you're doing, if those beliefs are justified. Okay, so that encapsulates the fundamental importance to our judgments of one another, of our attribution to them, of what they think they're doing. OK. So could we study that? That sounds maybe interesting, but maybe like philosophy. And as of 30, even 20 years ago, this is a topic for philosophers, not for neuroscientists. And so where my research has come in is to ask the question, could there be a neuroscience of the human capacity for thinking about thoughts? And I'm going to show you two pieces of the research that we've done. Obviously, in such a short talk, I can only show you a little bit of it. Um, and so I'm going to show you first the arguments we made. These are, more, these are older arguments that you can do a neuroscience of theory of mind. Um, and then I'm going to show you where we're, some of where we're going now, some of the newer techniques we're using that I hope maybe have applications outside of my own research, um, maybe for your own research, uh, using machine learning techniques to study information, um, and then the directions we're heading in studying uh, human development. OK, but so first, the very first question, can you study theory of mind with neuroscientific techniques? So starting almost 15 years ago, the approach we took was to ask uh, healthy human adults in uh, lying in uh, MRI machines, so lying inside uh, dark tubes in the basement of MIT, to engage in high-level social cognition. How do you do that? Well, we thought the most natural way that we engage in social cognition about one another is actually gossip by telling each other stories about each other. And so we asked people inside the tube to listen to stories about other people. Um, and in these stories, we evoked people having um, false beliefs, like the pirate in the story that I just showed you. Um, so these were uh, relatively mundane false beliefs, like Anne, who thinks that the blue dish contains lasagna, although it really contains spaghetti, compared to stories that had no people in them. And what we asked is, where in the brain was there greater metabolism when the stories were about people and their beliefs compared to when the stories were about the physical world? And found, as many other labs found, that there are a group of brain regions where metabolism was higher on average when people were reading stories about other people's beliefs. The most remarkable thing about this is how 
robust a signal this is. So you can find these regions in each individual participant who comes into the lab. Um, and this response is also very selective. So the response, and um, this is showing uh, blood oxygenation increasing as a function of time as people read stories about beliefs in the red or stories about the physical world in the blue. And um, from this one particular brain region shown here, the right temporal parietal junction. Um, and again, what we found there is that this brain region responds very robustly. The size of this response is comparable to early visual cortex responding to a visual grading. This is a, um, almost absurdly robust and reliable response in individuals when the stories are about other people's beliefs. Now that we've been doing this for 15 years, one of the things about this task is that we have not just the average response, but we can look at the distribution. Um, so this is 450 people, the uh, histogram of the size of the response in their right TPJ while um, reading stories like this. And part of why that's important is because once you have a distribution and not just an average activity, you can start to use this as a reference point for comparing even single individual patients to try to find um, whether there are uh, atypical activation patterns in individuals. For example, we've recently um, published a paper studying extremely rare patients with um, damage selectively to the amygdala and looking at how they compare to this typical distribution on this task. So that's the advantage of this task, but there are many disadvantages to this task as a way of identifying brain regions involved in theory of mind. And as I say, I've been working on this for 15 years, but I'm just going to show you one other task, one that has many, very different characteristics. So in these tasks, we asked people to read stories that we had written and designed to capture specific aspects of their cognition. In another task, we asked people to just watch a movie. This is a movie made by Pixar Animation Studios. And they didn't know that they were making stimuli for us. They were just making an entertaining film about a stork that delivers babies. And this is the cloud that makes the babies. This particular stork has a cloud with a tendency to make very dangerous babies leading the stork to feel somewhat envious of another stork whose cloud makes cute and safe babies, causing less physical damage. OK, so this movie made by Pixar, which I encourage you to watch, is six minutes long and evokes incredibly rich senses of the characters' mental lives and physical sensations. And so we just took their movie and coded it for the moments when people were thinking about characters' minds versus their bodies and asked where is their greater activation, for example, when the story evokes the characters' minds. And what we found was a group of brain regions more active when thinking about the characters' minds that in a sense looks a lot like the picture I just showed you before of the brain regions involved when people are reading stories about beliefs. But I am particularly not fond of arguments like that, that this looks like this. I think it's very easy in neuroimaging data to go wrong by making sort of qualitative judgments about whether one brain picture looks similar to another or not. Um, and so in my lab, I've advocated for a different approach where instead of just arguing that two images look similar, we identify specific functional brain regions in each individual participant by one signature. So here we find the brain regions in each individual that responds to the difference between these two kinds of stories. And then we ask how do those specific brain regions in that individual respond, for example, when watching a movie. This allows us to show that, for example, in this individu these individuals' right temporal parietal junction, there's no response to control parts of this movie involving general social interactions or to depictions of physical and bodily pain of the character, which happens a lot. There's very dangerous babies. Um, but there is a strong response when the movie evokes consideration of other people's, uh, of the character's thoughts and feelings, um, which is also true in um, the other parts of this network. A second thing about this movie is that, of course, since it evokes both thinking about characters' minds and their physical bodies, we can ask how are brain regions related when you're considering somebody else's mental states versus their physical body, their hunger, or their physical pain. Um, and what we found in this movie and in verbal stories is that our brains divide other people. Our brains are almost more dualist. Um, than the world is. They're as dualist as, as uh, Descartes. They divide other people into their physical and mental aspects. And so either reading about or watching movies depicting people's mental states evokes a completely different set of brain regions than um, thinking about their physical or bodily um, pain. 
Um, we've done this now in children as well and find the same activations. And this is children ages 7 to 12 years. And in my lab right now, we're using the same movie in children as young as 3 years, because as functional tasks go, this is the most entertaining task you could ask a 3-year-old to do. So if we're ever going to be able to get functional activation in children as young as 3, which so far hasn't been done, um, it could be from having as these kind of spontaneous and easily accessible um, films as stimuli. OK, so that is the first section, um, which is just a taste of the argument that we can study specific brain regions in order to figure out how people think about other people's thoughts. Um, but what I want to do next is tell you about the techniques we're using now, which go beyond these kind of um, more for A than B style analyses, um, in part because these, the new techniques involving machine learning and multivariate pattern analysis that I'm about to tell you about um, are taking over the world of fMRI. And so for any of you who might need to read cognitive neuroscience papers in the next five years, whether they're about theory of mind or anything else, um, these are the kinds of new techniques you're bound to be reading about. OK, so what are the new techniques that go involve? So the, part of why I, I'm so excited about these techniques is I think that the traditional style arguments that I just showed you have a tendency to conclude, as I just did, that a brain region like right temporal parietal junction is involved in a task like theory of mind. And after 10 years in this field, I started to feel like involved in was the central euphemism for cognitive neuroscience, covering up our inability to ask any of the questions we really wanted to know about representation and computation. We just said involved in. And so now I think um, new, these new techniques let us get beyond involvement to ask what are the representations that our brain region um, is engaged in. OK, so how? Well, here's how traditional fMRI works, like the fMRI that I did for the first 10 years. You are lying in a scanner, and you read a story. So for example, here's a story about Alice. She arrived at her vacation destination to learn that her baggage, including camping gear for her trip, hadn't made the flight. After waiting at the airport for two nights, Alice was informed her airline had lost her luggage altogether and wouldn't provide any compensation. I assume this is an experience you can relate to. Here's a task I'll ask you to do. So, of all the human emotions there are, I'm going to give you two. And I want you to raise your hand to the middle if you think she's furious and to the top if she's embarrassed. Is she furious or embarrassed? Go ahead. OK, how about this story? Sarah swore to her roommates she would keep her new diet. Later, she was getting a glass of water. She had a bite of their cake. Her roommates arrived home to find she'd eaten half the cake and broken her diet. Is she furious or embarrassed? OK, and just one more hint of how precise and rich your knowledge of this is. Think about the difference between the emotion she would experience in this case, when she swore to keep her diet and then had a bite of cake, versus if she had had the bite of cake and then sworn to keep her diet. Right? A completely different emotional tone. OK, so that's what we know about other people's mental states. But what do we measure with traditional MRI? We just measure the magnitude of activation in this brain region as you read these stories. And the magnitude of activation for both of those stories is high, because they both involve mental states. And what we conclude is that the right TPJ is involved in understanding both of these stories. Right? It's a conclusion about how much activity there is, how much of this kind of processing. But the knowledge that you have is not that these stories include descriptions of people's mental states and emotions. You know which emotion. And you know it in incredible detail. So you can make not distinctions between minds and bodies, but unbelievably sophisticated and rich distinctions within the mind between different mental states. So how could we capture that in a, a neuroscientific measure, uh, especially using fMRI? Okay, so here's the key idea. The key idea is that instead of looking at the amount of activity in an entire region, which summarizes over the entire neural population in that region, we could try to get at subpopulations within that region using spatial patterns of the activation in that region in MRI. Now, a priori, this should not work because MRI spatial resolution is terrible. Every voxel we measure is measuring hundreds of thousands of neurons. And so when Jim Haxby started saying 15 years ago, there's a spatial pattern in the MRI that looks at different neural subpopulations, most people like me thought, nah, probably not. But in fact, he was right. And there is an incredible amount of subtle information in the spatial pattern within a region of exactly where the neural populations are more or less active. It's the peaks and troughs of activation inside the regions that we had um, historically been studying. 
To give you a sense of how these analyses work, what we've done in our lab, so you read many stories like this. In this experiment, 200 stories describing other people's experiences. We take one set of them, so for example, the first 100, and we learn spatial patterns associated with the emotions in those stories. And then what we do is, for the next 100 stories, we take just the spatial pattern of activation in the brain region or in a group of brain regions, and we ask, can you tell from just the neural activation to this new story? You don't know anything about this new story, but can you tell me, is this new story about being, just looking at this pattern of activation, is it about being furious or about being embarrassed? So that's the new pattern. Is that story about being furious or about being embarrassed? Go ahead. Right, okay, so about half of you can do fMRI-based decoding, right? <laughs> so you can use the pattern of spatial activation to infer the emotional state of the character. You didn't know it was about Jenny being kicked out of her apartment by her boyfriend, who's cheated on her with another girl, but at least you knew that she was furious. And that's how our experiments work. Okay, so as I said, here I gave you an example based on a binary decoding task that was just furious versus embarrassed. In our actual experiment, it was a 20 alternative force choice, so we gave people 20 different emotional categories, 200 narratives about experiences. Um, so these are the two that you've already read. We also had positive experiences, like feeling proud of yourself for um, achieving a personal record on a marathon, or um, relieved when a car accident um, driving while texting did not lead to harm of the victim. So these are a huge range of human emotional experiences. What we then showed is that human observers have incredibly sophisticated and detailed knowledge of these, so um, extremely strong agreement about the dominant emotion, even on a 20-way alternative force choice um, task, so we can get very precise and highly agreed upon descriptions of what these emotions depict. And then we can ask, where in the brain is there a pattern information? So we're not looking at amount of activity, we're looking at pattern information that lets you decode in independent data the emotion that the character was experiencing, as you just did. Okay, so this is where in the brain there's pattern information that decodes which emotion above chance is in the story. Um, one thing you'll note is that that's extremely similar to the brain regions that I showed you before. And as I said, using this individually tailored approach where we take for each individual the specific region in this network and then ask whether it contains significant information to let us decode in new stories the one out of 20 emotions the character is experiencing. All of these brain regions do, and there's a hint that that information is non-redundant, so that there's different information in different brain regions, because when you combine across them, you can do even better. Okay, so that is what decoding looks like. We're now doing many projects around decoding, and again, I'm just going to give you one tiny taste of this by looking at a specific feature. So this says there's information, but you might want to know, okay, well, what is represented? Some information is represented, but what is it? And the specific feature that we started looking at is the one that I started with in this talk, which is distinguishing between harm caused knowingly and harm caused unknowingly. Um, we were interested in this feature because we had previously shown using TMS that um, if you cause transient disruption of activation in a brain region, so this is in the right TBJ, I'm going to actually just skip the demo, I assume many of you have seen TMS, so this is transient disruption of a cortical region in a healthy human being, that what you can do is selectively change people's moral judgments on this task. And the way that that happens is specifically that when the person kill somebody believing that the powder is sugar, so that was the first story that I told you, that that is judged more morally wrong. So if you for slightly miss that she thought it was sugar and you go with what she actually caused, namely the girl's death, right? you judge the accidental harms as more morally wrong, and we can create that effect with TMS to your right TPJ compared to TMS to a control site. Okay, so in this experiment, now trying to ask whether that feature is represented in the pattern of neural activity in the right TPJ, we had people reading stories about a character who caused harm accidentally or intentionally, so this is a character putting peanuts in the dish served to somebody who is severely aller allergic to peanuts. Um, the key thing about this experiment is we change only two to four words in these stories. So specifically, we just change whether you knew or did not know that your cousin was allergic to peanuts. So although these are very complicated stimuli, what we're altering in the stimuli is just an incredibly small feature, just this one set of words that say whether you knew or did not know the consequences of your action. These stories lead to robust but equivalent activity in the right TPJ. 
And what we were then able to show um, is that although the magnitude of activation is the same for these stories, the patterns are slightly different. So we were able to decode whether a story was about accidental or intentional harm, both in this experiment and in three other experiments. Um, and so this, this is the average activation showing that patterns of activity are more similar when they're matched on this one feature. This information was specific to the right TPJ. Um, but the particular thing that I want to show you is that across individuals, so there's some disagreement about how much moral blame you deserve for an accident. And that was true in this room, right? If somebody accidentally puts poison in a coffee believing that it's sugar, individuals differ in how much blame they think you deserve. And we can capture that difference. So this on the x-axis is your moral judgment of accidental harms. And on the y-axis is the pattern of activity in your right TPJ while you're reading about those harms. And what you can see is that about 35% of the variance in individuals' moral judgments of these stories can be captured by the difference in their right TPJ decoding that feature while they're reading these stories. We're interested in this for a lot of reasons, um, but one of them is that this feature is also different in high-functioning adults with autism. Um, so like in the TMS experiment I showed you, high-functioning adults with autism attribute more blame for accidental harms than education and IQ matched control participants. Um, and we found that there was no pattern information decoding this distinction um, in the right TPJ. Okay. That was slightly whirlwind because I realized I was running out of time. And I want to talk to you a little bit about where this is going. OK, so what I've shown you is that we know where to look in the brain, and we're beginning to know how to look as well to study the neural population responses and patterns that underlie computations and representations about other people's thoughts, beliefs, emotions, and intentions. So where is this research going? Well, the first thing that we thought to do and indeed have already done is study how these distinctions emerge in childhood. I started my talk by telling you that theory of mind undergoes dramatic changes in childhood. And we've already done experiments with children age 5 to 12 in fMRI looking at how these kinds of distinctions emerge as children's behavioral competence in theory of mind increases. The second thing that's interesting is how does experience, this is now much more cognitive experience than what you just heard about in the talk before, but nevertheless, childhood experience change children's developing theory of mind. We've studied that in a number of ways. One is by studying deaf children exposed to sign language or not exposed to sign language and how access to conversation with other people affects the development of these brain regions for theory of mind. We're also studying it by creating those experiences by um, deliberately training children on understanding specific kinds of mental states in other people and asking whether we can induce changes in the patterns in their right TPJ. So that's that research program. But the last thing that I want to leave you with is something I've been working on for a very long time um, and is just coming to fruition, um, which is that a lot of this research, most of the research in functional MRI in development is on children. That's because um, if you need to ask your participant to please lie still and watch a movie, the earliest age at which you can do that is age four, it turns out. That's the universal experience. We can get functional data in awake performing humans starting from age four. But most of the action of development that you just heard about is done by age four. And so if you want to study how things like myelination or early experience set up the early structure in the brain, you need to be able to do imaging in kids aged zero to four. And the people who are doing imaging in kids age 0 to 4 know you can't keep a baby still, so they study sleeping or anesthetized babies. But I'm interested in function. And so what I have been working on for the last eight years is trying to study the brains of babies while they're awake, watching movies and listening to sounds. So I've been trying to do this in my lab for eight years, and we have just started to be able to succeed in this research program. This movie is to show you how hard this is. Um, because if we spent the first five or six years of this research program trying to solve technical problems to make sure that scanning would be safe and comfortable and fun for babies because babies can withdraw their consent, we needed a chance to get good pictures of their brains. Um, and just to, again, to get you a, an intuition for why this is hard, if you are a parent, think about trying to take a family photo shoot and you have a four-month-old baby, and you want them to smile for the perfect photo, and they need to hold that smile exactly, moving your, their head for less than a millimeter for at least eight minutes. 
Okay, so our first results from this project should be coming, we hope, within the next month. Um, we've just finished collecting data from the first uh, nine, the first, well, seven babies. And I'm drawn to this research in particular because I think human infant brain development is where the action is. Human infant brains have a reputation for plasticity and potential, um, but there are limits to that plasticity. And what we're already seeing in our functional data is substantial structure in place, even in a four-month-old. And there are even cases where we see the opposite of plasticity, that is early vulnerability, more devastating effects of damage in infants than adult, in adults. And I see that as a central challenge. I think this is what is most exciting about the current opportunities in human cognitive neuroscience, is to ask how the growth of this one little biological organ accomplishes the amazing unfolding of a whole human mind. And that's all. Thank you. There is something weird about them. But, <laughs> um, but beyond that, uh, what happens, so going back to so your spatial stuff and the spatial pattern, what happens if you train them and then give them a completely ambiguous story? Train them on what? So if you give them your first 100 stories, so you understand all these patterns that are emerging, and then give them something completely ambiguous that either takes none of those emotions or mixes a whole whack of them together. In other words, could you find someone who's lying? Okay, so there's a whole bunch of ideas mixed into that talk, yeah. that question. Um, so pattern decoding certainly has been used for lie detection, if that's the question that you're asking. No, 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 not but, at all. Um, <laughs> the, so, and another way of asking, maybe one thing you're asking here is, um, so emotion attributions are not binary categories. They aren't, right? It's not like we see somebody and we think you are experiencing only fury and nothing else. There's a continuous representational space psychologically. Is there a continuous space neurally? Um, so in the data, there certainly is a continuous space. So we can say the more, so, so here's a dimension that we can decode I didn't tell you about. Um, is your belief justified? So this is something that matters in moral judgments. I told you about Grace, who believes that the powder is sugar because it's in a jar next to a coffee machine and it's labeled sugar. But I can vary how good her reason is for believing that it's sugar. What if it's just a jar in a chemical factory and she thinks it's sugar? Well, then she doesn't want to cause harm, but she shouldn't have thought it was sugar, right? That was negligent and irresponsible. Okay, so there's a continuous dimension there of how good her reason is for believing that it's sugar. So I can measure that continuous variation in your moral judgments. It makes a very big difference. This is something juries have to pay attention to, right? Very fine-grained differences in reasons for believing. And that shows up in the neural pattern, right? So the more you have a good reason for believing that you um, won't cause harm, the more different the pattern is from where you have a bad reason. So that's a continuous dimension in the neural pattern. Um, so it's certainly possible to create very ambiguous stories that will have a mix and not decode them, but failures of decoding are totally meaningless. What's interesting is, can you, for example, create a mix and then focuses, focus people's attention on one dimension or another and show that the dimension, for example, that they're attending to is the one that you can decode, and we can do that. Yeah, Adam Drunowski on Nestle Nutrition Council. I'm kind of struck by the fact that the examples you gave us are essentially very middle class, about <laughs> going to the gym, losing luggage, texting while driving, eating cake, you know, all the biking and camping and so on. So, you know, is this really a theory of middle class mind, or do you think that those things really do represent the broadest possible range of human emotional experience? Yes. So. Um, there's a lot packed into that question and a lot of possible answers. So, 
in these, ex these experiments that I've shown you, the stimuli that we made are intended to draw on familiar emotional experiences for the characters. But one thing, a deep and fundamental question in theory of mind, um, and not just neuroscientifically, is what is the scope of our capacity to represent the kinds of experiences we haven't had? Can we understand the mental lives of people way beyond our personal experiences? Um, and that is one of the questions I've worked on for the last 10 years. Um, not using a class difference usually, um, although I think class and culture are a very interesting dimension, um, but using something in some ways cleaner. So we wanted already 10 years ago to think about what is a group of human beings who might never have had a certain kind of experience, but nevertheless had the chance to learn about it so that we could ask, does having the experience or learning about it affect your mental representation? And so we did that with congenitally blind people thinking about sight. So for the last 10 years, we've been asking congenitally blind people what they know about the experiences of seeing. And one of the things that we found is that in the right TPJ, in typical, in healthy sighted adults, there's a robust response to stories about other people's experiences of hearing and seeing, but you can decode whether the people in the stories are hearing or seeing. And so we asked whether for blind people, that dimension of hearing versus seeing is also encoded in the pattern of response of right TPJ. And it is. So blind people do distinguish hearing and seeing and there are other people hearing and seeing in the right TPJ the same way we do. And in fact, in a big behavioral experiment, we then studied how much nuance do blind people have in what they know about experiences of seeing. So do they know, for example, that glowing is more similar to shining than it is to glittering? Right? That's a very subtle distinction, and they do. In fact, so far, in a whole bunch of incredibly subtle experiments, we can't find anything sighted people know about sight that blind people don't know. On the other hand, there is a lot about blindness that sighted people don't know. Okay, uh, Jim Simpkins, uh, have you thought about looking at have Thank you thought you. about looking at people who I guess we would classify as sociopaths? So they bring in to your test a completely, for this group, perverted view of other people's thoughts and emotions? So there's, there's um, really fascinating research on psychopathy, and uh, Mike Gazzaniga referred to some of this. The consensus in that field seems to be that psychopathy is not a disruption of theory of mind. It's not an incapacity to know what somebody else is thinking. In fact, psychopaths sometimes are particularly good at knowing what somebody else is thinking. They just don't care. And the capacity to care about what somebody else is thinking is associated with a different part of this network, one we have studied but that I didn't talk about, which is medial prefrontal cortex. So what we've shown, for example, is that while the right TPJ cares about things like, do you have good reason for your beliefs. Medial prefrontal cortex cares about do you feel happy or sad? Did you achieve your goals or not? And it's primarily in medial prefrontal cortex the deficits show up in psychopathy. This is actually a case I didn't get to talk about but find so fascinating. So I briefly referred to this at the end of my talk. What we usually think is that infant brains are more plastic than adult brains, which means that they're more resilient to damage. That's the canard principle. It's the thing that, it's the, you know, kind of default hypothesis by these days, that for example, if you have left hemisphere da damage to language cortex, the same damage has less devastating effects in infants. That's true than if the damage occurred in adults. Um, but there are exceptions, and one of the exceptions is ventral medial prefrontal cortex. So damage in adulthood to ventral medial prefrontal cortex has, def has effects, ha causes deficits in decision making and in moral judgment. But the equivalent damage in infancy has totally devastating effects, much worse than the same damage in adulthood. So there's something about ventral medial prefrontal cortex role in the learning of moral judgment that can't be compensated for by other cortical regions. It's the opposite of early plasticity. And I find that incredibly fascinating, both for what it says about ventral medial prefrontal cortex and for what it says about early social learning. About half the people in this room are nutritionists and half are neuroscientists, and each has an interest in the others, but uh, from the nutritionists, it's minimal in neuroscience, and I guess vice versa. So as a nutritionist, mine is minimal knowledge, but fascination with the topic. And uh, you asked us to raise our hands up or down based on a set of information, and, and, and we instantly did so. And I'm interested in two writers at the moment, Jonathan Haidt and 
uh, Robert Kahneman, who've written books about there being two forms of the brain, system one and system two. So instantly we made a decision about, about the morality of, or, or the rightness and wrongness about the treatment of this lady. And according to these writers, that's the end point for us. We are now going to justify all subsequent information based on that immediate decision. So if you start to tell me about the insurance company, you start to tell me about, I'm going to say, no, no, the lady should have thought of this, or God bless her, she didn't think of this. I'm going to keep my hand down or up. I'm not going to necessarily change it based on, is this pop neurobiology, or is it seriously regarded? That's what I want to know. <laughs> you Maybe it's not neurobiology at all. <laughs> Ooh, okay, so for any given decision that you're making, it's possible to put two factors that go into that decision on one spectrum and call the ends sort of fast, intuitive, heuristic, automatic, and the other end slow, deliberative, reflective, consciously accessible. Um, and that framework for thinking about a, a given process has turned out to be a powerful metaphor that's led to a lot of good research. So that's true. A simple-minded mapping of those onto two brain regions, literally two in any sense, has to be wrong. There's nothing, no function, not even the simplest decision that relies on one or two or a small countable number of brain regions or systems. Um, and so I guess what I feel like is, yes, that is well regarded as a um, as a metaphor for helping to organize our thinking about individual problems. But when then you then try to say, okay, there's um, fast automatic and slow reflective processes that go into deciding whether I want a tomato or an apple right now. And there's fast automatic and slow reflective processes that go into deciding whether somebody deserves to be jailed for murder or not. But is the fast automatic process the same one? Is that one fast automatic process for immediately grabbing an apple and sentencing somebody to jail? No, definitely not. Um, so again, I think that the access as a, the, this access as a metaphor is powerful, but the pop version of it, that there are two brains in any sense, is not. Is that helpful? Um, thank you. So Stefan Katsikis from Nestle. Thank you very much, Rebecca. That, that was really fascinating. A very simple technical question. Your subjects are reading or listening to these stories? And, and would the sensory modality have an impact on the value judgment? So um, for the brain systems that I study, these representations are extremely abstract. And we've shown there's no effect of whether you're reading a story, watching a movie, or listening to a story. Um, one of the other things we've shown is that as I just mentioned, there's no effect of the history of your personal sensory experience. So these abstract representations are the same in congenitally blind people as they are in sighted people. They're um, extremely resilient to sensory experience, although they represent other people's sensory experiences, but they're very abstract to your own sensory experience. Um, one of the things we've also studied is, um, so, right, other brain regions, of course, are not. And so outside of I think you, you can think of the response or representation to these stories as the combination of many different representational systems, some of which are responsive to the details of the experience of the stimulus, and other to the more abstract structure that you're creating out of that stimulus. And this particular brain region is highly abstract, resistant to the stimulus and the experience. Uh, uh, just, so two years ago, I was at uh, the Google Foo Camp meeting. And I ran into this guy who actually runs a company for Hollywood and, and the polit you know, for politicians to, to do brain scanning for political campaigns. <coughs> so, so, <coughs> so my question is, can you really, you know, from all the decoding you guys are doing, which is brilliant, can you really, <coughs> you know, from a, from a video for, <coughs> for politicians, can you really turn on particular feelings to, to make somebody like more or less, and because that's what he explained to me. This is how they're running, you know, the trailers for movies, you know, to hit the particular brain region, you might actually see the film when it's coming out. So I'm a cognitive neuroscientist, and I use functional MRI. And as a consequence, I feel that I have to toe a pretty fine line in the outside world. 
On the one hand, I don't want you to believe almost anything you ever read about fMRI because there's a phenomenal amount of crap um, in the literature, in the public press about the literature. My guess is more than half of what people tell you about the brain based on an image of it lighting up is false. So part of me wants to say buyer beware. In general, I don't believe anything I read. But on the other hand, many people have heard that before or come to that conclusion on their own. And I also don't want you to write off MRI because it is totally possible to use fMRI in a programmatic, productive, systematic way to test hypotheses with strong power and to genuinely distinguish between hypotheses. And I think that about five years ago, there was a tendency for people to see the infighting in the MRI community and decide that MRI itself was at fault and could never be trusted. And that is also wrong. And so I guess what I would say is it is technically possible to do the right fMRI experiment that could test a question you were interested in, right? There are robust reward signals in the brain that you can measure in neuroimaging. Third responses are what you're going for in your political campaign. It is certainly possible that either now or in the future, MRI could be a more reliable marker of the experience of reward than self-report, right? If your alternatives are introspection and self-report or MRI, I mean, I think introspection and self-report de deserves at least as much suspicion as MRI does, right? Two very unreliable measures. And so it's certainly possible that with research, you could get an MRI measure that is more predictive of behavior than people self-report is. And I know of one person who's done this. So Emily Falk, who works at UPenn, did this with um, smoking cessation campaigns. She compared the activations in different in, to people watching smoking cessation campaigns, and then used activity to predict responses when those campaigns were rolled out in real states to real smoking cessation hotlines. So the, these, there were three actual smoking cessation campaigns, and her outcome measure was during that video, a hotline number was at the bottom, which video produced most phone calls to the hotline number? And she found, this is a very small study comparing three campaigns to one another, so just three campaigns, that neuroimaging responses could do better than self-reflective re responses of a focus group in predicting which of those campaigns would be most effective in generating hotline calls. So it is certainly possible that a neuroimaging study could help you tailor a political campaign if you knew what behavior you were interested in and you did the experiment right. But my guess is, chances are that hasn't happened yet. Okay, our chairman asked for a very short question, then we're going to go Actually, it's, it's more a comment, going back to Mike's 50% uh, neuroscientist, 50% nutritionist. I happen to be a former neuroscientist trying to understand nutrition. And maybe you underestimate what I've learned over the last two years, which is how emotional relationship with food and the way we share it may be. So I actually think your, your work is extremely relevant to what we're trying to do, especially talking about brain development, if you can enter the pre-verbal um, time zone of children. So thank you very much for all of this. Thank you. Thank you.